So welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. My name is Brendan Baker, and uh, I'm a radio and podcast producer. I've been making radio since about 2006. I've done work as a audio fiction director, as a um, producer, as a reporter, as a consultant, as a sound designer, as an engineer. So um, I've had my hands in lots of different parts of the radio world over the years, um, and that's Part of why I'm doing this today is uh, because over that time, I've seen how software interfaces with those various um, parts of the radio world. And uh, um, and I've had some thoughts about how to do things uh, more efficiently through this program, Reaper, which is what I'll be showing you today. Oh, um, I'm also going to be relying a little bit on um, my friend Sam Greenspan, um, and they'll be in the chat helping with... Um, you know, answering questions. And sometimes with the chat, um, I it's, it's hard for me to like teach and look at the chat at the same time. So thanks to Sam for volunteering to do that. And, um, you know, as things come up in the chat, uh, look to Sam for uh, some extra support. And then, um, and I will also try to keep my eyes on the chat as well. And I'd also like today, uh, to open it up a little bit more, if you have questions, um, you know, a lot of a lot of times people say like leave your questions till the end, and I will have sort of a Q and A uh, portion at the very end if you're willing to stick all the way through to the end. Um, but especially as we go through this installation process, which I'll be walking everyone through together, things come up, and so feel free to raise your hand and open your mic and um, and have this be a little bit more like a you know open open workshop is the hope here. I have been working in radio and podcast production for many years, since about 2006. This is my website. Um, most recently, I did a project with Marvel. It was Wolverine. Uh, the Wolverine the Lost Trail was their second season, and Wolverine the Long Night was our first season. And I directed and sound designed that project along with Chloe Persinos. Um, before that, I spent about five years on this podcast, Love and Radio with Nick Vanderkolk. And that was the project that I really started digging into Reaper for the first time. Um, it's kind of funny to think that when Nick and I started working together in about 2011, we never lived in the same city and uh, we had to sort of figure out how we were going to collaborate over the internet and make this work. And I know that's something that we're all very accustomed to doing now, but at the time it was sort of like, oh, we had to hack things together. And actually, Reaper has, uh, that's one of the reasons why I really like Reaper is I think it uh, works really well for online collaboration. And I'll show you some of the reasons why that is over the course of today. But actually, when I just started with Nick on Love and Radio, I was really adamant that we use Logic Pro, Logic Studio, um, which is a, an Apple uh, digital audio workstation. And it wasn't until uh, I was doing this unrelated um, kind of boring audio tour that I was doing, just freelancing, um, cutting a bunch of tape. And I was like, well, let me take this opportunity to you know, uh, teach myself some new software. And um, I decided just to do it in Reaper just to learn it. And then once I figured out like, oh, this actually works in a, some different ways than other audio workstations that I've um, used before, uh, I just kind of kept going down deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. And uh, so that's you know why I'm here today is I've been using this program for about 10 years. And over the course of using it, I've really built up a lot of key commands and a way of uh, working, which as you'll see is in part based on um, Pro Tools key commands. And I'll explain why that is. Um, but this is sort of the product of me using it for a really long time. And so what I'll be sharing with you today is this special configuration file. And this configuration file is going to dramatically change the look and feel of Reaper. Um, and, uh, and that's the system that I'll be teaching today. So if you've already used Reaper before, um, I'm also going to be walking us through the whole process of backing up your current uh, system, your current settings, um, because my key commands are different than Reaper's uh, built-in key commands. Um, so uh, that way you'll have the ability to always go back and uh, you know, restore if you, if you don't like my system for whatever reason. And I'll show you a few different ways of doing that as well. Why am I doing this today? So having used a lot of different audio software over the course of my time in production, um, I've, I have no Pro Tools, I know Logic, I know Ableton, I know Reaper. Um, I've seen a lot of the advantages and disadvantages of all these different platforms. And one of the real advantages of Reaper, as you'll be seeing today, is that it's very customizable. So um, I've tried to sort of pick and choose and take um, strengths from all of these different platforms and combine them into a workflow that uh, I think will be hopefully relatively intuitive for everyone. And if you have experience on Pro Tools, um, hopefully it shouldn't feel like you're having to start from scratch. It should 
hopefully be a pretty smooth transition. The other reason that I'm doing this today, as some of you might know, there was this article that went around not too long ago, Pro Tools proficiency may be keeping us from diversifying audio. And the author basically made the argument that because Pro Tools is really expensive, which it is, um, and because uh, a lot of radio stations and podcast shops require people to know Pro Tools, that um, we might be actually limiting the pool of people who are making radio. And there are parts of this argument that I agree with and there are parts of it that I don't agree with. But after reading it, I was sort of like, well, I think my way of working actually is able to solve some of these problems. So it felt like the right time for me to um, finally break it out and, and share it with everyone. And this is actually something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Like I've wanted to create a system that I could share with people. And actually when I do projects, uh, my own projects, the system that I'll be giving you today is something that I give to the people that I work with. Um, and I've really seen how this configuration has, uh, you know, it, it's been something that once I teach it to people, they kind of take it and run with it. Um, so my hope today is to sort of treat you all as if you're on my team and I'm going to give you these tools and uh, hopefully you can take them and run with them and, you know, make cool things yourself. But why Reaper? Why Reaper versus any other um, program out there? Um, one, it, it's really accessible. It's super, uh, when, when I say accessible, what I mean is um, it's always available online to download. You can download it for free. Um, the program is not free, but it has a 60 day demo. Um, and uh, after the 60 days, it never stops working. It just keeps bugging you at, for five seconds when you start it saying like, please buy me. Um, but after 60 days, you should buy it. When you do buy it, it's only $60 for a small business license. And by small business license or non-commercial license, what they mean is if you make more than $20,000 with the program, then on the honor system, you should be upgrading to the, uh, the commercial license, which is $225. So even on the higher range of its price spectrum, it's still a lot more affordable than um, a lot of other digital audio workstations out there. Um, but if you're on the go, if you need to borrow a friend's computer to do some editing or whatever, like it's always just a download away. Um, and I'll be showing you a way of uh, taking your settings with you. So um, even if you customize it in this, uh, in a very particular way, like what I'm doing, um, it's really easy just to download this stuff and be up and running and have all your presets, have all your tools ready to go. Um, and actually, I even have a version of it that is, exists on a keychain, um, uh, just like a USB uh, thumb drive. So I, I have PC and Mac versions ready to go, and um, I can just plug it into almost any computer, uh, which is another reason I really like Reaper is it has a Mac version, it has a PC version, it has a Linux version, um, and the projects are all compatible across all those different versions. So uh, it really works on almost any computer and even older computers, like if your computer is made in the last decade, it'll run Reaper just fine. Um, and uh, so that like, that's one of the things that I often hear from Pro Tools users is like, oh, I have to you know, upgrade my computer because the new version of Pro Tools doesn't support it or, um, uh, or I need to, you know, I, I can't upgrade my operating system because Pro Tools won't support it. So all of these kind of hurdles don't exist with Reaper. Um, and well, I will point out one little quirk as we do our install, which has to do with um, people who are just on Catalina and Big Sur. Um, this won't prevent you from using the software. It's just like a little extra security setting we have to change. Um, so runs on all computers, even old computers. Uh, and I've also been telling people, I think Reaper sounds better. And, you know, by and large, I don't believe that different programs sound different, um, but Reaper has this special uh, option um, that has an automatic crossfade. So for people who are doing radio editing and doing dialogue editing, this automatic crossfade option basically allows you to sort of push items or regions or clips of audio into each other and make just automatically this little crossfade. And that thing alone, um, in my experience has improved the sound of a lot of the dialogue edits that I'm seeing when I'm teaching people. Um, so uh, that's why I say I think Reaper tends to sound better specifically for the radio work that, uh, that we're doing. Um, I think maybe the most important thing as far as radio goes though, is it has a, a really great approach to editing. Um, and part of this has to do with a feature called Ripple, which is sort of like the Pro Tools Shuffle 
but it works a little bit differently. And I, I'm going to demo all of this, but uh, it basically is a way of treating the entire project as if it were a single piece of tape. So you can make one edit globally in one really quick move, and it allows you to do some really micro type editing stuff um, at a very high level without potentially getting things out of alignment or um, uh, or uh, and just really fast. So I'll show you how that works. Um, it also reads almost every audio file I've ever put into it natively. So what I mean by that is in Pro Tools, um, if you want to use an MP3, yeah, uh, Pro Tools has to import that MP3 and turn it into a wave. And you're not gaining any quality by doing that. Um, it's just creating a larger file so Pro Tools can edit with it. And Reaper has this way of opening up all of these individual audio files and editing them, you know, as their own files. So, uh, so what that means is if you are using MP3s or older archival, archival audio that is maybe in a different format, um, your whole project session files actually be, can be a lot smaller um, because you don't have to up convert all of that time. Um, but um, I think the really amazing thing is like it opens almost any audio file that I've ever tried using. Um, and that's not true of most other uh, digital audio workstations. Uh, it reads OGG, it reads FLAC. Um, so uh, you can even record in those formats if you, if you want to. So uh, for the audio nerd, um, it really has a lot of power in that regard. It has unlimited tracks. So um, unlike Pro Tools, which uh, the sort of standard Pro Tools edition caps out at 128 tracks, which I realize is more than most folks are using. But um, if you want to go more than 128 tracks in Pro Tools, you have to upgrade to Pro Tools Ultimate. There are other things that like you can only do in Pro Tools Ultimate uh, that and Pro Tools Ultimate costs $2,000 as opposed to $600. So Reaper, it's $60 and it's the same program for the whole thing. Um, and it, it, the features are never sort of uh, turned off. Um, for people who do a lot of plugin stuff, if you're using a lot of plugins, it also has really efficient CPU management. And what that means is basically it's only using uh, plugins in the instances and moments when it needs to. It's not like running the plugins the whole time. Um, and I'll demo how that works. It, it also has this way of sort of pre-rendering audio when you're using a lot of processor intensive plugins. So what this all means is you can use a lot more plugins than you can use in, um, in Pro Tools. And when I try to do the same kinds of things that I'm doing in Reaper in Pro Tools, the system usually just grinds to a halt. So uh, I'm able to make a lot more complex projects and I'll show you what some of those complex projects look like on my end. If you're an engineer or if you are sort of a system administrator type person and you're uh, in the position of having to manage teams of people who maybe don't have a lot of tech experience, uh, it has this way of saving presets and templates, which is also possible in many other programs, but also saving it as a single file. So if someone's settings get out of whack or whatever, you can just have them uh, re-upload this whole configuration file and there's, their settings will go back to whatever they were originally supposed to be. So it's a really efficient way of also um, working with teams of people who have a wide range of tech uh, experience. It also just has a bunch of other features that I find really helpful for organization um, and for collaboration and managing projects. And um, I'll be demoing part of that today as well. There are other things that I've been calling the more esoteric reasons why I like Reaper. And it has mostly to do with like how it feels when I'm editing and um, the workflow. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with its customizability and its flexibility. I will say that, uh, especially if you're new to Reaper, it does have a lot of options. It does have a lot of menus, um, a lot of preferences, and that can seem intimidating at first blush sometimes. But what I want to encourage everyone to do is to just uh, sort of take it on faith that um, if you can kind of roll with it and get used to it, I think what you'll find is that all of these options and menus and whatnot are things that can really fade into the background and let you focus really on what it is that you're trying to achieve in the, in the software um, and then you know, at whatever moment you want to start going deeper with it, uh, those options are always available for you. And, um, you know, I've been able to make it do almost anything I want it to do, <laughs> audio, audio wise. Like sometimes it takes a little bit of uh, thought, but um, almost any sort of technical issue I run into, I've been able to sort of configure it and customize it and um, make it do things that just aren't possible to do on other uh, editing platforms.
But I think the thing that I really appreciate most is that I can approach it on a few levels. Uh, I can, you know, just cut a two way and not have to worry about, you know, all the different options and depth and, and menus and stuff like that. But when I do want power, um, it has a lot of depth for me. So uh, especially if you are just sort of dipping your toes in the sound design world and you're wanting to do more, you know, uh, complex mix type stuff, uh, it kind of grows with you. And even uh, for me, someone who's been using the program for 10 years uh, and knows it pretty well, uh, almost every time I boot it up and start working in it, I'm finding you know new tricks that I can add to my bag of tricks. Uh, uh, and I can turn those new ideas into key commands really quickly. So the program kind of gr has grown with me. And, um, and that's something that I'm hoping other people can experience too, is like, uh, I'm going to be showing you my way of working today. And this is this configuration that I'll be sharing is sort of like stepping into my audio brain a little bit. But um, ultimately, I, I uh, envision a world where any producer can start customizing and making a setup that works well for their own workflow. And um, so I'm just showing you how I do it for me and, and you can, you know, take it and and maybe even improve it. So, yeah, I don't know. It sounds kind of corny, but... Um, it's a program that's really shaped the way that I've made radio and uh, I, has, by its design, encouraged me to take risks and do um, interesting things. And um, that's part of what I'm wanting to share with you all today. So the way this is going to work is uh, we're going to spend the next few minutes installing Reaper together. Some of you might have already installed it um, in the past, or maybe you already have experience with Reaper. Uh, I'm going to ask you to update along with us and follow along um, just so we're all up to date and on the same version. Reaper is really good about being backward compatible. I've never run into an issue where uh, upgrading to a, the new version has you know, prevented me from opening older versions or anything like that. So uh, it's very good for that kind of thing. Um, and then we'll also walk through this process of um, uh, backing up your system in case you want to, you know, roll back if, if the key commands that I'm giving you today aren't, aren't for you. Um, uh, after we do the installation, I'll do sort of a quick kind of, um, uh, just sort of a orientation of, of what the software looks like and how it works and what some of the differences are between it and Pro Tools and other software. Um, and so I'll kind of go through panel by panel and just describe giving you a tour. After that, um, I am going to show you the template, which is part of the configuration that I will be giving you today. And just to, I'm just going to sort of give you a preview of this. So um, in Reaper, uh, once you install this configuration file that I'm giving you, if you go to File and Project Templates, there'll be this thing called Brendan Baker's Radio and Podcast Template. And this is basically a way of organizing projects and um, it has some preset plugins um, and I'll be describing how the plugins work. So if you can stick around to the end, I'll go through this whole template. Um, I'll walk through all the different plugins that I'm using and I'll also be talking about uh, my recommendations for how to mix with it. And if you follow the system, um, you should get mixes that are pretty consistently uh, delivered at uh, an appropriate loudness spec. So um, for the podcast world, that's typically negative uh, 18 LUFS. Um, and I'll talk more about loudness and LUFS and all that stuff later. But um, so just to give you a broad overview, um, it's going to be installation, then talking about Reaper and the key commands and you know how it works and giving a demo. Then we're going to talk about the template. Um, and that will include discussion of sound design um, and, uh, so if you can stick all the way through the end, that's, that's where we'll go. And then at the very end, I'll, I'll demo, um, uh, an excerpt of a love and radio piece that I made. And, um, you can see sort of how some of these tools are all working together. So, uh, let's just start with installation and I'm going to do this all with you. By the way, if you can follow along, if you if you happen to have two screens, um, I'm going to encourage you to have Zoom in one screen and Reaper in the other screen so you can kind of um, get the key commands and whatnot in your fingers. Uh, if you only have one screen, if it's possible for you to sort of have Zoom and Reaper open at the same time uh, in kind of smaller windows, uh, I would encourage you to give that a shot too. So the first thing to do is to download Reaper, the program itself. And... Uh, when you go to reaper.fm and download 
you're going to see a few different versions. If you're on Windows, I'm going to say get the 64-bit version. And if you're on a Mac, I'm going to say get the 10.15 plus version. The difference here is the 10.15 plus is a 64-bit version, but um, it has this extra notarization, which Apple requires for Catalina and Big Sur. Um, if you're on Mojave, uh, you can just go for the 64-bit version straight up, but um, it, it won't, you won't, there won't be a real disadvantage to going for 10.15 plus. So I'm just going to encourage everyone, let's just go for the 10.15 plus. Um, and this notarization issue is going to come up when we install the next step, which is the SWS extensions, um, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But just a heads up that most of the headaches that I've run into in these workshops have all centered around people who are running Catalina or Big Sur, and they all have to do with this notarization uh, issue, which I'll, I'll explain and walk you through. The only real reason you'd ever go for the 32-bit version at this point would be if you have 32-bit plugins, or if you have an older computer that doesn't support 64-bit. Um, so if you have 32-bit plugins, you can run, you can have actually, you can install both 32 and 64-bit in parallel. So to recap, Windows 64-bit, Mac 10.15 plus. So I'm just going to download the, the Mac version so I can follow along with everyone. The next thing that we're all going to install uh, is this, the SWS extension. And the SWS extension is basically, uh, it's something that installs inside of Reaper, and it will give us an extra um, panel to our menu bar called extensions, and it allows us to do a whole bunch of extra cool stuff that my configuration relies on. So uh, uh, just to sort of give you a spoiler, um, one of the things that it allows us to do is automatic loudness normalization. So you can just take a file and have it do some analysis and um, raise or lower the volume depending on you know whatever our target is. If you are on Windows, get the x64 version of the SWS extension. If you're on the Mac, get the x64 version. And by the way, if anyone has one of those new M1 Macs uh, with the, um, the new Apple Silicon, I'm going to still encourage you to get the 10.15 plus version. There is a beta version um, that is coded for the M1 processors. It's down here. Um, but the reason that I'm going to tell you not to get that today also has to do with plugins um, because uh, a lot of audio plugins are not yet um, coded for the M1 processor. So um, so get the 10.15 plus regardless is what I'm going to tell people. And if you if you do uh, ultimately upgrade your plugins and everything becomes M1 compatible, then you can start to explore the um, ARM64 version. And as you can see, there is an ARM64 version of the Mac as well, but we're going to be getting the x64 version. And if you're on Linux, uh, there, there are Linux versions of Reaper as well. Um, and I did have one person who was running Linux in one of these sessions before. So just to know that they're available, I won't be going into any depth on them, but um, just to know that they're available and you can follow along. And I'll trust you to know which versions to get if you are a Linux user. So that's the SWS extension. And then the last thing I'm going to have you download is this, the Ulean loudness meter. And this is a plugin, um, it's a free plugin, and it graphs loudness over time. And this isn't strictly speaking necessary for my configuration, but the template that I have does use this plugin and it's part of um, how I teach people about loudness and stuff. So to um, so get it, and if you go to, I can't see it because my camera's covering it. Here we go, download, download, and you can get the um, Windows or Mac version for your computer. So if you are a Windows user, um, your installation process is going to be very easy. You're going to um, install the exe files and just use all the defaults and you should be just fine. Um, for Mac users, we're going to walk through this together step by step because there is a specific order in which we should do this. And this is where some of the problems crop up. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and doing it together here. So if you've got all those files, I'm going to follow along here. And I'm going to do this along with you. So I'm going to go to my downloads directory. So I'm first going to open the uh, Reaper DMG. And it's going to have a DMG file like this, or a DMG installer. And what you're going to do is super easy. You're just going to drag and drop 
Reaper 64 into applications. You don't have to worry about this remote thing. Um, I won't be talking about that. Uh, because I already have Reaper installed on my system, I'm gonna do something slightly different called a portable install, which basically means um, I'm going to be, instead of installing Reaper to my applications, I'm gonna install it in its own folder. And this is how you would do that. Um, you know, if that thing, if you wanna have it on a, a USB uh, thumb drive or something like that, this is the, how you do it. Um, if you're on a PC and you want to do the portable install, um, you'll probably notice when you install Reaper, there's a little checkbox saying um, make a portable install, and then you can direct it to, you know, whatever location you want it to make that portable install in. Um, but I'm doing this today, uh, making a portable install, both just to show you the process um, and also so it doesn't compete with the uh, pre-existing configuration of Reaper that I already have ready to go and loaded. So with the portable install really, um, the only thing that's different is instead of putting it in your applications, you put it in a blank folder. And then this is sort of the weird part you put in. This is just a text file. It's a blank text file that I've renamed reaper.ini so that you can see it's zero bytes. There is nothing inside it. It's just an empty text file renamed reaper.ini. Um, and what that file does is it tells this application, OK, uh, install the program in this folder rather than installing it in the whole system. So that's what I'm doing. Um, so tell you what, how about we install the, I always forget to do this. Let's install the Ulean loudness meter before we do SWS, cause that should be a pretty simple process. So I'm just unzipping the zip, opening this folder, Ulean loudness meter, and then you'll see a installer.pkg and you can install it and just go through all of its presets and it will ask you to restart your, pro, your computer. You don't have to restart your computer. Don't restart your computer. <laughs> you don't need to. So I'm just going to hit continue and uh, put in my password. It's going to eventually tell me to restart and I'm going to say no. Oh, it didn't have me restart. I guess they changed that in the recent version. That's great. Okay, so Ulean is taken care of at this point. Now, on the Mac, the next thing that we're all going to do together is launch Reaper for the first time. And you need to launch Reaper for the first time before you do any of this SWS extension installation. So I'm going to double click on Reaper. In your case, it'll be in the applications folder. And um, it's going to scan through plugins if you have plugins. I'm telling it to ignore my plugins because I don't want to take all that time of um, having it run through that process in front of you. But if you have third party plugins, let it just do its thing and um, and scan those plugins and that way they'll be accessible when you use Reaper. So when you open it for the first time, it takes a little bit longer to launch because it's installing all of these files. Um, and in your case, it's going to be installing them in the user library in application support. You don't have to worry about this, uh, but it's sort of installing it in a hidden backdoor part of your computer. Um, and I'm just sort of doing it in a more, in the portable version, I'm doing it in this all in this one folder. So it'll say, uh, you've not yet selected an audio device. You can say, say yes. And here um, you can choose your audio device. And what I recommend, um, unless you specifically know that you wanna do something differently, I recommend sticking with the default system setting devices on the Mac. What that means is um, rather than going down here and selecting a specific device that I want it to use, I can instead go up to my system volume control. You actually hit option and click it, and then you can get, you can independently set your input and output devices on your Mac this way. Um, so if I go through the system default system devices uh, thing, it'll follow whatever my Mac is using um, for its audio drivers. So that's what I recommend. And then you'll also notice that it popped up this. This is the sort of Reaper is not free. You're starting your 60 day demo and um, still evaluating. And again, like I said, after the 60 days, it still works. Um, but if you like it as much as I like it, you'll be very happy to give them $60 for it. So this is the base program. And so now we've installed the, you know, the, the main engine of the system that we'll be using today. And if you notice, um, 
right now in the menu bar, I don't have this uh, extra extensions panel. That's what we're going to be installing next in the SWS extensions. So this is how you do it. And I'm going to try to walk through this a little bit more slowly because this is where I sometimes lose people. And this is where the problems occur on the Mac side. So all together, what we're going to do is we're going to go to options on the menu bar. And we're going to scroll. I can't see it because my camera's in the way. This is great. Options and scroll down <laughs> to show Reaper resource uh, directory and finder. And what that's going to do is it's going to reveal that hidden folder that it installed all of this extra, all the guts, all the engine, the sort of behind the scenes stuff. It's going to reveal that folder in your finder. So again, just to recap, you go to options and show, <laughs> show Reaper in, uh, in the finder. And it should pop up like this. And when this folder pops up, you're going to look for another folder inside of it called user plugins. So double click that and open it. And if this is your first time using Reaper, it should be blank. So this is where we're going to install the SWS extension. So um, if you're following me at this point, you're going to go to your downloads directory and then um, open up your SWS DMG. And instead of doing this, this does not work. You cannot drag and drop the Reaper DYLib file onto user plugins here. You've got to put it all the way over here into the um, user plugins folder. If you're on Windows, you don't have to worry about any of this because uh, all you have to do is just install the SWS exe file and run its defaults and it will, it'll just work. Um, so uh, this is only something that the people on the Mac side need to worry about right now. And by the way, uh, this whole thing has been broken for a long time, the fact that it, you can't just drag and drop it. And I've been in touch with the developers um, and it's something that they're aware of and they're working on. Um, the reason is the people who make SWS extension are, uh, they're a different group than the people who are coding Reaper on a day-to-day -day basis and it's a volunteer run thing. So um, that's why they don't have um, the, it updated in uh, quite as quickly. So I'm gonna just say this one more time um, the whole process for installing SWS is opening Reaper for the first time, going to options, showing the Reaper system folder right here, and then there's a user plugins folder. And then you drag and drop the Reaper SWS 64 dylib file into that folder. Let's all quit Reaper now and we're going to relaunch it. So just quit Reaper and relaunch it. If you are on Catalina or Big Sur, this is where you're going to have an error. Um, and I'm going to walk you through your security settings in order to uh, address that. But if you're on Mojave or earlier, the way that you should know that it's been installed successfully is that now on the menu bar right next to actions, you should have this new panel extensions. So that's how you know it worked. For those of you who are on Catalina or Big Sur, this is what you're gonna do. Okay, some people might be getting an error. The Mac OS cannot verify this app is free from malware. If you are having problems right now, if you don't have the extensions installed, can you raise your hand on the Zoom? Okay, so Anna, Anna, Shira. Let's start with Shira. Uh, you can open up your mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I have a pop-up that says um, that it can't be verified that it's free from malware and I have two choices, move to trash or cancel. Okay. Um, can you share your screen? All right, can you see my screen? Yes. So I have um, this, this is the pop-up that I was talking about. Yeah, uh, right? so I hit cancel right now instead of move to trash. So if anyone else has this problem, we're gonna walk through it all together. So uh, just click into Reaper really quickly and now go to options and scroll down to show Reaper resource path. And look for that user plugins folder. There it is. 
Okay, so the file is there. That's good. That's the first thing we if, if the file's not there for anyone who has the same problem, if the file's not there, that's a problem. This is where you would need to copy that um, Reaper SWS dylib file into that folder. So this is good, Shira. Now, um, now let's go to your security preferences. You're going to go up to your Apple and system preferences. And then in system preferences, we're going to go to security and privacy. And there are multiple tabs here. You want to go to the general tab. And then down here, it should say something like, um, you know, SWS DYLib is uh, an unidentified, from an unidentified developer. And, um, um, and then you should have the ability to accept that SWS DYLib in your security settings. So you just accept it. And once you've done that, you'll have to restart Reaper. Okay, so and I'm there in it general. is at the very bottom. Yeah, so say allow anyway. And now restart your Reaper. Do I need to do anything with this lock here? It looks like you didn't have to, so that's nice. Okay. I always thought you did, but um, I haven't upgraded to <laughs> Catalina yet, so. Okay, let's try this. All right, um, so now I have the option to open. So open it. And it looks like we're good. And you have it, yay. Awesome, Very thank good. you so much. So we are going to go into Reaper and go to our preferences. So that's under options and it's at the very bottom. Reaper preferences. And this is part of what makes Reaper so powerful is if you were to click on these, you can configure just about anything about how the, the program runs and works. But instead of dealing with all of this right now, I just go up to general at the very top and you're gonna see at the, um, so you click on general here and you're going to see import and export configuration. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to export our configuration so we can always go back. So just follow along with me, if you will. Export configuration. And by default, it's just going to have the one configuration um, box checked. I'm going to recommend that we check all of them. And that way, if you've been using Reaper for a while, um, you will be able to recall absolutely all of your settings. So check every single box. So when you hit export, um, you're gonna save this configuration file that we're making as like default settings. And then I usually put the date um, and hit save. And that's going to take all of the files that were in our configuration and save them. And just to prove the point, um, I'm going to hit cancel here for a minute. If I were to go to options, show resource, Reaper resource path, the file that we just made is contained under the configurations folder. So for power users, this is where you'd look when you save multiple configurations. But now um, we're going to do sort of the opposite of that. We're going to go to Reaper preferences, so options, and then it's the very last thing under options, or control P if you're on Windows, or command comma if you're on Mac. And general at the very top, we're going to do the inverse of that, which is importing a configuration. And now I'm going to navigate to my downloads directory where you just got that configuration file from me, and then select that configuration file and hit open. And it's going to say importing configuration will require Reaper to restart, and that's OK. So hit OK. And it's going to give you a similar box. You want to make sure they're all checked. There are fewer of them. And then hit Import. It's going to relaunch Reaper. Oh, cancel my plugin scan. OK. And now Reaper should look pretty different. And if you've used Pro Tools before, it should look somewhat familiar. So I'm going to hit Still Evaluating. And so what I've done here is uh, I've changed a bunch of settings all at once. And so this is where if you're a system admin or if you're an engineer working with other people, super powerful because you can configure your version, send it to the people you're working with, and they can just open you know, the way that you've got it set up. 
other cool thing is that uh, if someone is using the default version of Reaper and you're sending them a project using this special configuration, they can still open it. Um, so that's part of why I think Reaper is especially accessible is that you can have people doing their own customizations and whatnot. Um, and uh, and the, the program still reads the same data. So unless you're using a third party plugin or something like that, that individual users won't have, um, uh, the projects are, are compatible across versions, compatible even if you just downloaded Reaper from the internet. And this is where I'm just going to take a moment to point out that when you have a portable install like this, you can actually have multiple copies of Reaper running at the same time. So on the one side here, this is the portable install that I just made. Point being, uh, unlike Pro Tools and unlike most audio software, uh, you can actually have multiple copies of the program running at the same time, which is sort of interesting. But I'm going to close this portable version now because I don't need it anymore. And I've already got all of my stuff set up for you all here. Okay. So let's just talk about Reaper and the layout and what makes it a little bit different from Pro Tools. Um, and the first thing that you'll notice is, on my screen at least, is that I can have multiple projects open in different tabs at a time. And this alone has been a huge game changer for my workflow, being able to um, have different sessions and not uh, have to close and open the program each time. Um, it also allows you to copy and paste things across different projects. So it's a huge workflow uh, streamline uh, that I, I would like to see happen in other, uh, other programs as well. Um, but by default, you're going to just have a screen like this. Um, and if you ever want to make a new tab, all you have to do is go to File and New Project tab. You can have as many tabs open as you want. But by default, it'll just give you this layout with a single track. And I'm going to put some more links in the chat here. And this is going to be for some demo music and demo voice. If you happen to have your own files that you want to use, go for it. Uh, you do not have to download these files if you don't want to. Um, but here is a piece of music for you to test. And here is a voice, my voice. Uh, the music is a piece of music that I made. And then the voice is an excerpt from one of my previous sessions. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is just drag and drop those files after I've downloaded them into Reaper. So I've got my downloads folder here, just drag and drop music, and then about me, that's my voice. Oh, and one big difference, well, actually, yours might have this turned on as well. Um, let me ask, are you getting the colored waveforms or are you getting the black and white waveforms on your version? I think I forgot to turn this feature off, in which case you're going to get all the colored waveforms. You got colors. Great. So let's talk about the colors. The colors are kind of weird, right? I intended to turn this feature off to make it uh, less confusing, but um, it's a cool feature of Reaper, and I think it's super powerful. So let's talk a little bit about the colors, um, just because that's the very first weird thing that you're going to notice. Um, if we go to File and um, where is it? Peaks Display Mode, you should get this. And this will let you, what I intended is for ha to have you see the, just this normal black and white peaks mode. But this will let you switch between looking at a wave file or an audio file uh, with this normal waveform, or you can do spectral peaks. And the reason that I have spectra, the reason that I intended to turn it off by default is one, I think it's just a little bit more confusing to people. Um, but two, it takes a little bit extra time to uh, have the computer calculate the colors um, before when you're first, the first time you're importing the audio. But what Spectral Peaks means is that it changes the color based on um, the, the frequency of the audio. So to get the setting, you go to view and Peaks display mode right there, or peaks display settings. And here you can change the mode from normal peaks, which is just kind of your normal black and white waveform, spectral peaks. And then uh, you'll notice it also has a spectrogram mode. So if anyone has used Isotope RX and is familiar with spectrograms, um, it can calculate those as well. 
And I won't be talking very much about this because uh, that's like a whole other discussion for us to have, but you can do some basic spectral editing in Reaper as well. Um, pivoting back to the spectral peaks though, why spectral peaks are cool. So different sounds will have different colors based on whether they're more bassy or more trebly. And you can see sort of a representation of that here on, the, um, on this rainbow. And what that means for speech and dialogue editing in particular, if I just solo this track, is similar parts of speech, similar vowel sounds will have the same color. So um, for instance, black sounds tend to be much more noisy sounds, things that are more like S's or kind of consonant sounds. So if I pinpoint to the black areas, just to it's pretty design. So those are all my S's, which is kind of interesting. And for anyone who's been dialogue editing for a while, you probably start to have a sense of what the shape of an S looks like. But this is a way of like going a level deeper um, that you can see both the shape and the frequency. So if you're doing a, a kind of dialogue editing where you're trying to make vowel sounds match, sometimes people's tonality will shift. And this is a way of being able to see whether or not those tonal edits are going to work or not. Um, I am. Uh, so you can see the orange stuff all has kind of the same, my, uh, same tone. And for the best. Um, and green will be something a little bit higher, probably. Sick. Oh, I guess that's an S. Sick. Anyway, I find this helpful, um, and it's pretty fun. Um, and especially if you're just learning how to dialogue edit, it can be a really helpful way of um, understanding what's happening inside the sound. And similarly, if you, uh, if you want to go into the spectrogram mode, for anyone who uh, has used spectrograms before, you can also start to read these almost as if it were a musical score. So I can see that these bursts of energy up here are going to be the S sounds. And this is also kind so, of a handy way of uh, is that checking your edit. Like, if you are in a tricky spot, you can look at the spectrogram mode. And, um, and then in moments when it's darker, that's silence. And then you can start to see, like, I, I, I'm so experienced with this that I know that this is going to be a breath right here. <laughs> so you can really start to almost like play these uh, magical games with your friends. Like, uh, what, what is this going to sound like? Here's another breath right here, a big one. <laughs> um, oh, that's an interesting, uh, Alexander says, I'm red, green, colorblind. Would be easier to hit an option button to get an alternate. Um, there is a way of changing the color spectrum. So you can pick different colors. Uh, and it, it, it's in this peaks display settings. Um, and you can shift it. Um, and I don't know if that would be helpful for you or not. But um, maybe it would be. Uh, <laughs> Noor, Noor says, my linguistics brain is losing it over the spectrogram mode. Uh, one of the very first audio like art projects I ever did in college was this collage. I was taking a, a linguistics class. And I did this thing where I recorded all the different linguistic uh, sounds, uh, you know, phenomes into Pro Tools in this case. And, uh, and I tried to make collages and make myself say different things. So like, this is kind of a way of seeing those parts of speech, um, you know, represented in a new way. Anyway, I'm going to go back to normal peaks mode because uh, it's what folks are probably used to. Um, and just know that this is, uh, we went on this whole digression of the peaks display mode, but uh, know that it's there for you. And if you want to keep it on, you can have it on. OK. Now, you'll notice that when you import these files into Reaper, uh, it is going to create a peaks folder in wherever those files existed. And that peaks folder will contain the data for, um, for each one of those files, so all the waveform data. And um, that's what it takes a little bit of time to calculate when you're doing the spectral mode. Um, so as you start to uh, Im import more and more files, you'll notice these peaks folders popping up in your system. And you can delete them, um, but I recommend, well, you can delete them, but every time you reopen your project, Reaper is going to have to do um, that recalculating them all over again. I'm jumping ahead here, but uh, when we save, when we ultimately save a session, um, uh, I have it set up in a way where it'll, it'll put those peak folders in the actual session folder when you save. But because right now we're in an unsaved project, as you can see up here, um, it's just going to create those peak folders um, wherever those files existed. This is sort of the way Ableton Live works, if anyone is familiar with that. Um, and uh, so 
I will talk more about spectral peaks, but before I do that, I just want to say one more note about the peaks folder. For people who are pro users, you can customize uh, Reaper to save the peaks folders in a, in a single directory, and then you can periodically clear them out if you want to. I don't have it set up to do that because I am collaborating with people on Dropbox, and I want those peak folders to always be showing up along with the entire session. Um, that way, I don't have to recalculate them each time I'm opening the program. So that's why I have it set up the way that I have it set up. But if you're a pro user and you want to um, customize the way that works, if you open up preferences, at the very bottom, there's this little find box, and you do a a find for peaks. This will basically point out every time peaks is mentioned in the whole setting. So this is a really handy way of searching through things. But the very first thing that you'll see is under, um, I'm scrolling through all of them, paths. So general paths. And you have this option to say, hey, Reaper, store all of your peaks in this one folder if you want. So if you want to do it, that's how you do it. So let's just talk about some other things about Reaper. Um, one thing coming from Pro Tools is that in Pro Tools, you probably know that you have stereo tracks and you have mono tracks and you can't cross them. That's not the case in Reaper. In Reaper, tracks are tracks. And so this is a mono file. And if I push the mono file, let me make some space for it. If I push the mono file down on the stereo track, it just works. So um, you don't have to uh, worry about whether you're on a mono or stereo track. You also don't have to worry about what sample rate you're at. Um, it'll read your sample rate natively by default. Um, so it's really easy to mix and match things of all sorts of different types. Um, and that goes with uh, plugins as well. You don't have to deal with um, mono versions versus stereo versions of plugins. Um, for the power users, there is this option in the corner right here, this little blue box, which will let you say how many channels per track you want. You can do up to 64 channels per track in um, Reaper, which is one of the reasons why people who are doing surround and ambisonic work are using Reaper, um, because to get that kind of functionality in Pro Tools, you have to buy the um, $2,000 version. <laughs> so you don't have to do that with Reaper. Anyway, that's how you do that. Um, so tracks are tracks. And also, you don't have aux tracks in the same way as you would in Pro Tools. Uh, if you wanted to make an aux track, you just make a new track. Um, and you can route things into your aux track. You can create folder tracks, which is something that Pro Tools added recently. The way I do that is by shift clicking tracks. So I'm highlighting two tracks by holding down shift and clicking. And then I can drag and sort of indent by, I have to kind of push in and up on my mouse. And you can see this little white line. This is also how you'd reorder tracks, by the way. But with a little indent, oh, I didn't do it right. With a little indent, you can make a folder track. And so this can be like uh, your mix bus or um, you'll see in my template, I use these folder tracks quite a bit. Um, but this is a way of routing sound from what we call child uh, tracks into parent tracks. So if this is your parent track, you can see when I play this, like kind of one of the first projects where I really, uh, I'm getting audio signal in both of these tracks as well. I'm just going to quickly run some processes on this for my own sanity. And I'll talk more about what I'm doing here in a bit. I'm going to talk more about the navigation and moving and zooming and all that, because I know we've had some questions about that in the chat. We'll get to that in a minute. But before I do that, let me just sort of give a quick overview of the layout of the whole program. So um, we've got the main arrange view right here, which is where we put the files. We've got our tracks control panel here on the side. Um, I've got a tracks manager which is sort of like Pro Tools. I actually don't use this very often in my own work, but I have it set up this way uh, specifically to cater to people who are coming from Pro Tools. But this is a way of selecting and changing different things about the tracks themselves. You can also do that directly from the track control panel. Um, but this is also a way of um, coloring tracks if you want to color them. Um, but I'm going to show you a quicker way of doing color in a minute. Uh, let me just undo that. Um, and uh, we've got a navigator on the top, which is sort of like our map of the whole session, which I can expand and contract, and it scales accordingly. And you can see if I move something around, the map changes. So that's one uh, thing to be aware of. And then on the side here, uh, I've got uh, this uh, media, uh, media 
FX browser. And the second tab, there are multiple tabs here, but the second tab is, um, is like your clips list in Pro Tools. And I'll give you a little rundown about this in a minute, um, but I wanted to sort of go one step at a time. These windows are all scalable, by the way, so you can move them. Um, and then you can even, if you right click, and by the way, uh, one thing about Reaper is you can right click on almost anything and get more functions. But if you right click, you can undock anything that's on the side and you can float it as its own panel. So you can really customize it and you know, change the way it looks. And if you have two screens, you can put panels in two different screens. But by default, this is how I've got it set up with the tracks manager here and the uh, project effects bay here. And um, I'm going to have you mostly focus on the second tab, the media items tab. I'm also going to talk about shortcuts to navigation. But before I do that, I want to introduce you to one other new thing, which is unlike any other uh, audio program or really any other program that I've ever used, which is unique to Reaper and part of what makes it so powerful. And that's called the actions list. So if you go up to actions and show action list, you can also see that the key command for it is a question mark, which I think is meaningful because um, basically if you have questions, the action list is a good place to get those questions answered. Um, the actions list is a display of every possible thing that the program can do and its corresponding key command. So if you scroll down, the program can do a lot more things than we have key commands set up for. But if I want to figure out what a key command is, one way of doing that is I can hit find shortcut. And then if I do control E or command E, which is that's the edit command in Pro Tools, it'll jump me to that function. Um, you know, so if I hit the B key, it'll tell me what the B key does. So this is a way of looking up um, pre-existing key commands. The other way of using this actions list is um, if you wanted to make a key command, you can in this filter box right up here. And you'll notice this filter box is actually a feature that is throughout most of the dialog boxes in Reaper. The filter box is a way of searching and narrowing down your options so you're only seeing the things that are relevant to you. So if I wanted to look for um, key commands that had to do with fades, for example, I could just type fade. And now it's narrowed down my options, so I'm only seeing the ones that have to do with fade. And I can even organize it by shortcut, and now I see all of my fade shortcuts right up here. And then, so as you can see, one of the ways I make a fade is with the F key, like in Pro Tools. But if I wanted to change that for whatever reason, I could go to Add and type in a new key command or set of key commands. And this is how I've been programming it, is I've made a whole you know, workflow that is based on a Pro Tools way of working. Um, and I've really actually made a lot of the Pro Tools key commands work. Not everyone is going to work, and some of them work slightly differently, um, which I'll walk you all through. But this is how you'd start to change it and customize it for yourself. Um, if anyone also uses like MIDI controllers, you can also like have a MIDI learn type thing. You can um, like hit a button on your MIDI controller and then um, it'll learn that as well. So that's another cool thing. I'm gonna actually open up Pro Tools and talk a little bit about the difference between Pro Tools and Reaper in terms of how it works. So in Pro Tools, you have tools up here and uh, you, your, your cursor does different things depending on the tool that you select. So if you wanted to trim, you'd hit the trim tool. If you wanna do the select, you'd hit the select tool, and delete things. Um, if you want to move things around, you'd hit the grabber tool, you'd move things around that way. And then if you've been using Pro Tools, you also know that um, you can have a multi-tool up here, which links all of these together. And then depending on where you hover your mouse, you get different functionality. So you can trim by holding there, you can do a fade, um, you can select from the top, you can grab from the bottom and move. Um, so. In Pro Tools, I hate using the multi-tool. Um, and the reason for that is when I want to get up close to doing something at the end, I find that it's kind of finicky. Like it doesn't make adjustments quite in the way I want to, especially if I want to do any micro editing right near the end of the file. It's just, it doesn't 
it doesn't change its modes as intelligently as I would like it to. Um, and I'm often struggling. So in Pro Tools, I am do, doing key commands to like uh, choose the different tool I want to work. And that's how I, how I, how I roll. Um, so I say all this to say that uh, the way I've set Reaper up, which is different from how it is configured by, um, by default, is I have it set up to do a, a, a multi-tool-like approach. So just to review, if I wanted to move an item, and um, in Pro Tools, this is called a clip. In Reaper, this is called an item. If you've been using Pro Tools for a while, you might call this a region. Um, but in Reaper speak, this is called an item. Um, and that's important because uh, like when we go to the media items tab, we, I just want to sort of introduce that as a, as a term that we'll be using. So if I grab the bottom of an item, that's how I move it around. If I grab the top and scan, that's how I make a selection, just like Pro Tools. If I want to get a fade, I grab it from the top. Um, if I want to trim, I grab it from the side. If you've used Pro Tools before, the, the ways to make edits or splits are Command-E or the B key. And so both of those work. But I'm going to just point out that I've done something a little bit differently. So Command-E works exactly the way you'd expect it to work in Pro Tools. But I've done something different with the B key. With the B key, I've customized it. So it's what I call a hover edit. So normally when you edit in audio software, you have to click. And then you've got like this red line. That's your edit cursor. You make the edit, and it makes the edit on the edit cursor. Straight enough, right? But with the hover, all I have to do is mouse over where I want to make an edit. So I'm using the B key to do this, which reminds me, I don't have my key command software turned on. So I'm going to turn that on. Okay, so now you can see on the bottom there, and you can follow along with my mouse and stuff. Um, okay, so I can very easily just do B, 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 and not have to ever click my mouse. Um, so I find that's a very uh, time-saving uh, change. And also, it works well even when I'm playing. I started... So if I'm going to uh, solo this track. 2006, I've been and a I consultant can edit on as very... I go. So if I had a, a big audio file where I kind of knew, I could see in the waveform where the pauses were and I wanted to start making breaks and stuff, um, I can just sort of look at them and say, okay, I know I want to make an edit there. I know I want to make an edit there. And um, it's a, a really time-saving tool. And so I've added this hover functionality um, to some of the other editing uh, key commands in in Reaper as well um, that are based off of Pro Tools. So if you've used Pro Tools, you are probably familiar that the A key will cut from, or trim rather, from the end of a, a clip to the edit cursor. So if I click and hit A, that's what it looks like. And then S does sort of the opposite. It, it's fr from the other side of the edit. So those work, but I have them set up to hover. So um, I don't have to click. I can just mouse where I want to go, and it'll make those edits automatically. Similarly, with the D and G keys, that's for fades. Um, so you don't have to do a fade like this. You can also just point your mouse where you want it to go and hit D for a fade on that side and G for a fade on the other side. So that's like Pro Tools. And the only difference here is that you just don't have to click. Um, but if you do click and make the key command, it'll still work. So. Um, so by and large, that has uh, saved me a lot of time and hopefully will save you time as well. Uh, by the way, this circle, is that's just part of my, um, I've just added the circles to, for, um, so people can see where my mouse is. That's not part of Reaper. This is just, a, just for displaying. <laughs> that's, that's not part of the hover. So that's your basic editing. Let's talk about navigation and zooming and stuff like that. So, uh, in Reaper, zooming in and out is the up and down keys. In Pro Tools, it's the R and T keys, and they both work here. Also in Pro Tools, command bracket, open bracket and close bracket will also zoom in and out. So that works. Um, I also, because R and T is kind of the zooming that I think most people are accustomed to in Pro Tools, um, and also because in Pro Tools, I very rarely would use the one, two, three, four, five, six keys. Um, I have changed four and five to a vertical zoom in and out. So between R and T, 
zooming in and out on the horizontal plane. And then right above, just slide your fingers right up to four and five, that zooms on the vertical plane. So you can do all your zooming just in that little four key block right there. Um, but that's not the way that I normally zoom. The way I do it, because I have a mouse that has a scroll and um, also a mouse that scrolls both X and Y, this also works if you have a trackpad, I hold down the command key. Um, by the way, if you're on Windows, whenever I say command key, like uh, whenever this symbol comes up, this is actually your control key. Um, this symbol is option on Mac, but alt on Windows. And this symbol is control on Mac, but the start key on, um, uh, on Windows. So if you see these symbols as they pop up, as I do key commands, this is command, this on Mac, this is command, option, control. And on Windows, this is control, alt, uh, Windows key. <laughs> so just be aware of that. Um, now, uh, so I am holding down the command key and then using my scroll, and that's how I zoom. And I find that this speeds up a lot of time, especially if I'm working on a big project. So this is my project for um, an episode on the first season of Wolverine. And there are many hundreds of tracks, um, but I can just scroll up and down for one, just to like scroll through the project, but I can also zoom into things with holding down command and then scrolling up and down and stretching things and finding things that way. Um, I can also go up to this navigator here and I can move the navigator around and zoom to things that way. Or I can hold down shift and kind of draw where I want to look. So I'm just going to do this in a different project. Let's say I wanted to just focus on this pink stuff, which is um, my sound design. I can use shift and just draw it up here on the navigator. And now I'm jumping to that point directly on my range view. Or if I just wanted to focus on my edit, I could shift and just draw it around the edit. And now I'm looking at um, only the dialogue portion of the project. Um, so that's how I navigate. Uh, oh, other thing you can do is hold down command and then right drag. And when I say right drag, what I mean is you're right clicking or secondary clicking, um, second mouse clicking and dragging. And that is sort of like grabbing the background of the whole project and moving things that way. And by the way, um, all of these uh, scroll things are all customizable. Um, depending on what how you have your trackpad or your mouse set up, the directions might be different. Um, so you can set that up independently in your system preferences, but you can also go into Reaper preferences and mouse, I think mouse, where is it? I'm just going to look up the word scroll. You can change. Oh, here it is. Um, so it's under, it's actually general and keyboard multi touch. You can change the direction of um, how things operate here if you want to get more micro in, in what you're doing. So that's always available to you if you want to customize it if you don't like the direction that um, the scrolling works. Okay, so that's navigation, um, zooming. Um, let me just pause here for a moment and open it up. Are there any questions about just sort of the basic editing or navigation at this point? I have a question. Yeah. Um, how did you get that parent track um, up, like that mixed bus? Yeah. Um, so this is maybe jumping ahead a little bit, but I'll just answer your question and we'll talk about it. So if I make a new track, um, and I have a couple different key commands set up for that. One is Command T just to make a track, so I can make as many tracks as I want. Um, here, tell you what, I'm going to delete the parent track for a minute and just totally start from scratch, and then you can see how I've done it. So I'm making a bunch of tracks. These bottom two ones right here, if I, I'm going to shift click them, so I, I'm selecting both of them. But if I hold onto them and sort of drag and push them under and up, it will kind of nestle them beneath this track. So now this one becomes a parent track. That's, that's one way of doing it. Um, I'm going to undo that and show you another way of doing it, which is 
I'm just gonna stretch this track out a little bit so you can see it more effectively. Um, by hitting this right here, this thing that looks like a folder, that will make it a folder track. And that um, folder track, parent track, it's the same thing basically. Um, and that will make it so any track that is indented beneath it is routing audio into that folder track. It also means that any mixing you do on this parent track or any plugins that you put on this parent track will apply to the audio that is being routed from the, the child tracks. Um, there are other ways of setting up um, sends and receives and buses. Uh, and if you are uh, an engineer type and you uh, do that kind of thing, it all, it's all done here in this little box. Um, so for example, let's just say uh, this is a piece of music. Hold on, did the wrong thing. I'm gonna name this track music. Well, we'll do it with this piece of music. Let's say I wanted, I'm gonna delete this. I wanted to create a send into a reverb. That's something that people do frequently. So I'm just gonna call this reverb. If I click this panel up here and I go send, I can send the music track to the reverb track like that. And then I get um, a little fader that I can automate. And I'll talk about automation and all that stuff in a little bit. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Another interesting thing that you can do is if I go to the reverb track and hit receive, I can have it receive from the music track. It's the same connection. It's just changing the sort of perspective. And now that I've set that up, if I close this and open the panel here on demo music, you can see that I've got a send configured. So um, it's just a different way of looking at it under the hood. Um, so if you ever want to do something that would be like an, an aux track in Pro Tools, it's basically just making a new track and, um, and setting it up in, you know, whatever routing you want to set it up as. So you can have as many tracks being sent to a, as many other tracks as you want. And actually, this is a really huge part of my sound design process. So like in the Wolverine session, for example, you'll see that um, I, ha well, there are a bunch of sends and receives happening behind the hood but there are also a bunch of these indentations of folder tracks. And um, that's kind of how I do a lot of my literal sound design is I'm trying to recreate the way that sound works in the real world by um, creating sort of folders and folders within folders. So if I want to say, have a scene where someone's voice is coming through a television, but that television is in a bar and then there are characters in that bar and there's a reverb that is being applied to both the characters and the television, I create these kind of Russian doll-like structures of, um, of sound. Um, and that's how I do a lot of my routing for um, radio drama. Let's talk about uh, coloring tracks. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a demo of this whole thing in a minute, but just because I think coloring is something that's really important and it's a big part of my process. You can see this thing right up here that's like a little color swatch. If you click it, it should open up um, the color swatch. And you'll notice that there, there's track up here and item. And depending on whatever I clicked last, whether I clicked an item of sound or whether I clicked a track, this will change. So if I click a track and want to color the track orange, it's going to color all the items in that track orange. But if I make some edits and color individual regions, region, see I'm doing the Pro Tools thing, coloring individual items, different colors, you'll notice that um, color overrides the uh, item color overrides track color, which is, I think, how it works in Pro Tools as well. And then if I were to change the track color, those item colors stick, but the things that haven't been specifically marked with an item color um, will change to the track color. So this is actually a big part of how I keep track of um, things when I'm in a very early stage of uh, like editing an interview is like if there's a, a item that uh, of, of a portion of the interview that I think is good, you know, I might color it green. And then if there's something that I'm like, eh, maybe I'll keep it, maybe not, I'll color it yellow. And like, if it's red, uh, that's like, uh, that's definitely not gonna be in, or maybe I'll just delete it. But um, so I, I sometimes use color at early stages just to sort of as a way of reacting to my tape. But then eventually what I'll often do, and I'll just show this in this Love and Radio project is um, I will group a subject uh, by 
color. So each one of these color blocks is like a different topic in the story. Um, and then you can see I have room tone with its own color. So that's how I keep track of like, what's room tone? What's, you know? Um, and you can see that in this early part of the chapter, uh, a little bit of this section, I moved to the end for flow. So it's, it's a way of being able to keep track of, um, you know, what your tape is. And obviously you can do this in Pro Tools too, uh, but that's how I use color. Um, and then I also use color to differentiate you know, music versus sound effects versus actualities versus, you know, things that are recorded in the studio. Um, so that's color. I'm just realizing there's there's something about uh, editing that I didn't talk about, which I, I want to include, uh, and I want to make sure I just don't forget it. Um, I was talking about the different key command modifiers, um, the these symbols a moment ago. Um, those modifiers will also change your mouse actions. So it doesn't just have to modify your key commands. For example, um, let's take this item right here in the middle. If I hold down shift and I hold down my mouse and move back and forth, I can slide the audio within that region like that. Um, that's something that you can't do in the same way in Pro Tools. In Pro Tools, there's a way of um, nudging within the, the clip, which I just learned about recently. Um, but this is a way of, with your mouse, being able to just very easily slide between um, uh, between the uh, the region. Um, and if you can't right click, that probably means that you have your Mac uh, your Mac isn't configured to use the right click, which is you'll have to go to your system preferences in your Mac system and make sure that your mouse can um, do that right click. Um, but I recommend turning that on, and I recommend also for your trackpad, making it so uh, it's it's a secondary click. If you put two fingers and click with two fingers, that does the same thing as giving you a right click. Um, so if you don't have that configured on your Mac, do it um, because it will be very helpful for you. So you can shift and slide within a region like that. It's great for like um, doing like micro things around dialogue edits if you want to tighten up a breath or something like that, but not change the overall you know length of the edit. That's one thing that you can do sometimes. Um, and it, uh, it also is good for music edits. So like, for example, if I know that the beat drops at this one moment, I can slide and make that beat drop line up wherever, um, I want it to. Oh, one other thing that I, I didn't show is, um, so if I hold on option and drag, I can stretch audio that way. Around. So I have it set up um, by default to keep the same pitch if you change the time. Um, and you can also, uh, you know, time compress things. The whole idea behind this is that, you know, someone could learn this system. This is not something you typically do in most radio, but uh, it's kind of a sound design -y thing. And um, so it, it's just nice to know that if you wanted to time stretch something, all you have to do is hold down option and do it that way. Um, you can also do hit I, the I key will make these little um, stretch points and then you can change things exponentially and you can do all sorts of weird time stretchy stuff. Um, so like I said, by default, I have it set up so it's not changing the pitch, but um, I haven't talked about the properties menu yet. I should talk about the properties menu. Um, if you double click any item, it'll open up this properties menu. And one of the properties is preserving the pitch when changing the rate. So if I turn that off, now it's going to act more like magnetic tape. Set of key commands, but um, okay. so you can play it more as if it were, you know, uh, tape. Um, I can also double click on the settings and turn its playback rate back to one and reset it. So how about I take a minute just to talk about the properties window since, um, since that's where I went. We'll, we'll get back to this. Uh, toolbar in a minute. The properties window is super, super powerful. Um, if you double click any item, it opens up this properties window. And uh, this is basically all the information about, um, uh, about that item in space and time in the project, um, including its position in the session, how long the, the clip is or the item is, 
um, what its name is, and also where, where the item starts in reference to the beginning of that file. So this is really helpful in a radio context if you have a really, um, if you have a really good log. So let's just say, for example, I knew that there was a piece of tape that I really needed that started at you know, 15 seconds. So I can double click it to open up the media, media properties window. And then I can, in the start in store, source, start in source window, that's at one minute, 15 seconds. Then if I wanted to switch it to like one minute, 30 seconds, hit apply. And now it'll shift it to that spot. So that can be really helpful if you've got really well logged tape. But the thing that you'll be using the properties menu for most frequently is just labeling your tape, naming it. So notice that if you double click on it, the first thing that it takes you to before any of these other things, the thing that's in blue right here is the name of the item. So you can you know, do Brendan's voice, hit OK. And now you can see that this piece of tape up here is called Brendan's voice. And when you've got the media effects bay on the side, you can actually see like this is where the Brendan's voice piece of tape lived and I can like pull it out. Um, so if you want to start like doing the, this is something that I think Radiolab did a lot um, and is sort of well known in the industry for is um, logging your tape in the, uh, the DAW itself. This is how you do it basically. Um, and then you can always have your clips and, um, and uh, grab from there. The quickest way to rename an item though, I think is just to double click and then start typing. Because because this is the first thing that's highlighted, all you have to do is just double click, double click, start typing, you know, new tape, hit enter, and then you're good to go. Sam adds in the chat, do note that about transcribing in the box that there's a character limit. Um, so that is helpful to know. I typically don't transcribe word for word in tape. I do it more, um, like I said, subject. Um, so I'm kind of using keywords and things like that. There are other ways of logging your tape in Reaper too, which I'll show in a minute, um, which are not about changing the label, but, um, but yeah. So really important thing, if you didn't catch it, uh, just labeling your tape, double click, start typing, um, and that will change the name. How about next, um, we just go give a little tour of the, the menu bar up here. Um, so if you mouse over, um, it'll give you little previews of what the, the function is. So this is new project. This is open project. This is save project. It also shows you the key commands for that. This is project settings, um, which I'll just click and show you what that looks like. Uh, when you click project settings, you'll get something like this, which these are settings that are specific to the RPP file itself. In a minute, I'm going to talk about notes, leaving notes in the notepad. Um, and you can leave a note that is tied to the project. So if I wanted to, if I was collaborating with someone, say, um, and I wanted to make a to-do list, I could make my to-do list and, you know, um, leave my initials and then click this, show notes on project load. And that way, whenever my collaborator opens the file next time, they'll be prompted with that note. So that can be really handy. Um, project settings is also where you'd get into, like, if you wanted to set a specific sample rate for the project, um, by default, I have it set up so it, you can use any sample rate and it'll just follow the sample rate of your, um, your system. Um, but this is where one of the places where you could change that. Um, and if you do music and stuff, you can change the time and time signature. And, uh, and this is all specific to the project itself. This is not the same thing as going into the preferences. These are like preferences, but for that project only. Um, video settings, you can video edit in Reaper. All of my YouTube videos that I've done, I've edited in Reaper. Anyway, project settings, that's what that is. Uh, this is undo. This is redo. This is your metronome. If you're doing music stuff, um, I have it turned off by default. But if you hear a clicking sound, that's what you want to turn off. Um, I've added some buttons that are not in the normal Reaper uh, stock configuration. This one is for rendering. Um, so when it's time to finally bounce your file, this is how you'd bounce it is up here with this thing that looks like a little waveform and a hard drive. If you click it, it'll open up the, the render dialog. And I'll talk more about that much later. Um, but just to know that that is a quick way of rendering your session. Next to that is uh, a master fader. And um, this is sort of unusual. This is a trick I picked up from Jeff Entman of Here Be Monsters. Uh, 
the podcast. And I sometimes like having the master fader just sort of off to the side um, as a way of checking my levels throughout the project. And I've configured the master fader in a certain way. So um, you'll notice that there, when I play audio, Pro Tools from time to time, they'll still have a similar set of key commands that they can work. There are two colors. There's the blue, which is your peak level. That's the kind of metering that you'd see in Pro Tools. And then on the uh, outside is the You know, someone level. could learn this. And this green level um, is, for anyone who's an engineer, this is a, an RMS meter, um, but I've configured it uh, in a very slow way. So it's, it's an RMS meter with a window of three seconds, which means it's kind of mimicking the way that a LUFS meter or a loudness meter works. Um, so the green levels are basically a way of, uh, at just a, a glance, being able to see what your loudness units uh, might be. Um, I'll talk more about measuring loudness units specifically when we get into my template, um, but this is just a way of doing it right from the, the master fader. So that's an option, you can use it or not, um, and that's how you turn it on and off. And if you want, like everything in Reaper, if you right-click it, you get more options. So just for example, um, in Pro Tools, the way you'd bring up the mixer is command equals. So I just brought up the mixer. And if I right-click on my master fader, I can put it in the mixer instead, put it there, I can move it on the left side of the mixer if I want it to. I can also um, float it as its own separate panel, but by default, I have it configured so it's docked, meaning it's uh, on the side right there. And that's how you turn it on and off. This right-click anything is super powerful, by the way. Like, it, it works on items. So, like, um, if I were to make a fade, for example, and I right-click, I can change the fade shape. I can also hold down command and change the page shape that way. Um, I can right click on really just about anything on these panels too. Um, right clicking basically, if, there, if you have a feeling that you should be able to do something and, um, and you just don't know how, how to set it up in Reaper, uh, right click is a great way to explore because um, nine times out of 10, the thing that you wanna do is gonna be in that extra right click uh, option. So just be aware that you can right click anything. Uh, Alexander, do you have a question? Yeah, hiya. So um, there's this uh, one way of navigating through uh, in Logic Pro clips that I like a lot and I don't know how to do in any other DAW I've learned, but it is to um, primary, uh, primary click plus shift a clip and you could click the like one clip and then not the clip that's right next to it, but then the next clip um, and it doesn't shift click all of them. It's just the ones that you have primary click directly and you can move those things around um, and you can select like clips in multiple tracks. It's just like really nice and I cannot do it in Pro Tools or an audition. Uh, there may be a way and I just can't figure it out, but I'd love to know how to do that in this program as well. To select uh, multiple items across multiple tracks by shift primary clicking and being able to move them in the, like in the multi-track session, like in time. Like you could- so, Like moving that together, them. like- Yeah, like, yeah, like that, yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it should just be like command clicking to select multiple items like that. Yeah. And then you can move them all together. Cool, great, that's exactly what I want. Thank you so much. Another way of doing that would be groups, which I haven't gotten to yet, but I will get to in a moment. From here, let's, uh, let's continue on with this toolbar. This next one right here is the auto crossfade on and off. And so what you'll notice is that if I've got a, an edit right here, and if I push an item into another item like this, it's making an automatic crossfade. And that's something that I recommend turning on um, because it really does improve the sound of edits, um, especially if you're doing a more complex edit. Like obviously this is just a split in between one region of tape, um, but, uh, but that's how you do it. And in my own work, I'm like kind of obsessive about making sure that there are always crossfades in edits and making sure that um, in patches of silence are all done with room tone. So you can see like everything, almost everything has uh, a crossfade, and then I even crossfade when I'm entering and exiting an item of room tone. So I think the automatic crossfades are super powerful, but if you turn it off by clicking this button, 
it will behave more like Pro Tools behaves. So I can um, move one item over another item, and you can see kind of a ghost of the outline translucent behind it. But if I let go, and then I move it again, now that's been chopped off. So that's how it works by default in Pro Tools, and that's how it'll work if you turn automatic um, crossfade off. There's another, uh, if you right click on this, there's another option, trim content behind media items. Uh, you can do that and then, oh, well, you have to turn auto crossfade off, but you can make it so they actually kind of overlap and occupy the same space. I find that very confusing, so I recommend not messing with that. But if you have something that looks like this, where you're sort of seeing two things on top of each other, um, if you right click here, make sure that trim behind media items when editing is turned on. But I recommend just keeping the auto crossfade on um, because I think that that is the most helpful option uh, unless you very specifically want to have that um, trimming functionality the way that you do it in Pro Tools. This next button right here is groups. In Pro Tools, there are two different types of groups. There's track grouping and then there's clip grouping. Um, and there is a way to do track grouping sort of in Reaper, but um, it doesn't it doesn't work in the, quite the same way as Pro Tools, where if you edit on one track, it edits the other track. It, it, what Reaper is doing when you group tracks is you're just grouping the basic fader um, and um, mute solo, that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, so I don't recommend that people do that. Instead, I recommend that people experiment with item grouping, or it's like clip gr grouping in Pro Tools. So um, in Pro Tools, that would be if you highlight a, a group of items or select a group of items, um, Command Option G. Also Command G works. I have both of those working. So Command G or Command Option G, if you're used to doing it the Pro Tools way, will group things. And then Command U or Command Option U will ungroup them. So if I want things to be grouped and travel together, so if I move one, I'm moving the other. And this is sort of, Alexander, to your uh, question, this is another way of doing something kind of like what you're talking about. Uh, I realize it's a little bit different, but that's how you'd set up a group. Um, and one of the kind of cool things about this is that you can name the group and you can have separate groups for different things. So here um, on my uh, project bay, path, you know how there are multiple tabs. One of those tabs is item groups. And so it'll tell me uh, what, what the group is and what all the different items within that group are called. And I can like name that like uh, intro sequence or whatever. And then that way I can always, you know, um, reference it back. So that's a nice way of keeping track of things that you're grouping together in a list. So that's grouping. But uh, this button right here, when it's turned off, will temporarily disable groups for the whole project. So if this button isn't turned on, and I try to move something that's been grouped, it's separate again. So grouping will mean they'll move together. So I recommend basically keeping this on at all times, um, unless you are very specifically changing something in a pre-existing group, and then you would disable it for a moment and then turn it back on. Um, but uh, that's what that does. This next button is like your slip and shuffle. And that is so important that I'm actually going to pause to talk about it. And I'm going to finish talking about the rest of this stuff and then circle back on it. Um, but know that this button is uh, the, it's not shuffle, it's called ripple in Reaper speak. Um, but uh, that's what that is. And I'll talk more about it in a minute. Next here is the uh, automation follows edit or automation follows item. So what that means is, and I'll talk more about doing volume automation in a little bit, but uh, if I've got something with volume automation, I'm automating the volume of the music here while the speaking is happening. Um, when this is turned on, if I move this item, the automation that I've drawn moves with it. But when I've turned this off, and I move it, the automation stays put, but the items move. So 99% of the time, I think you're gonna want this on, um, otherwise it can cause problems. And I think anyone who's edited uh, projects knows that has been burned by this at one point or another. Um, but uh, if you run into that kind of behavior, make sure that this is turned on, turn it back on immediately. Uh, and the, what I tell people is, 
Um, basically keep it on all the time unless there's a specific moment that you want to change your, uh, the relationship between your automation and your items. Um, one example of that might be if you had like a perfectly you know, drawn curve and uh, you really wanted the music to hit at just the right space with that curve, you could turn off the, you know, that thing and then, and then find where the music fits in relationship to that. Um, but actually, I don't even do that these days. I just keep this on all the time. And then if I'm in that scenario, I'll use the shift. Um, well, right now I'm doing it to my entire group, but let me ungroup these. Uh, use the shift slide thing and then make the music um, fit with my automation that way, rather than potentially running into the error of um, getting my automation out of line. So that's automation follows edit. Next to that is your grid. And so if you're doing stuff with music, this is how you turn the grid on and off. Um, I recommend just keeping it off unless you're specifically doing stuff with music or MIDI. Um, but you'll notice also that there's sort of a grid behind the grid. And this is another trick that I got from Jeff Entman. Um, and uh, what I've done is set these alternating stripes up in um, 10 second intervals. So that way I can, you know, take a piece of tape and line it up and know that this is going to be like, you know, about uh, 25 seconds. So that's one way of doing that. It can be really handy. Jeff actually has his setup for minute intervals, um, but I thought 10 seconds was more helpful for the kinds of situations that I typically want to sort of figure out how long something is. Um, also, you'll notice this is a, a huge thing um, and has honestly been a game changer for me in my editing is do you notice how when I take an item, I have these guidelines surrounding it in teal. So the guidelines are a really handy way of um, making sure that like if you want to line several items up at once, not only can you see it, but you also can feel it if the, the snap feature is turned on. So I actually can feel in, in the, like it, it resists for a moment when I'm pushing this item um, uh, when the guideline is touching or about to cross over the boundary of another region. Um, so that is another just like game changing feature for me. Um, but that has to do a lot with this next feature, which is the snap whether snap is on or off. And um, snap meaning like, does it have that kind of magnetic feeling of two items bumping into uh, one another? And one very uh, sort of common thing that you'll notice with snap, let's say I'm doing a, an edit between two items. If I'm pushing one item into the other one, before it hits that crossfade, there's a slight snap. And that way I know that it's like, you know, it's, it's totally 100% flush against the other item. Um, and then if I push it past the snap, that's when the crossfade starts to happen. So you actually start to get a feel for this kind of stuff in a really nice way um, that I don't get in Pro Tools um, and, uh, and not in many other programs as well. Um, and basically what I tell people is leave this on all the time unless you happen to find the snapping annoying for whatever reason. If you turn it off, uh, then things will just flow smoothly, you know, into one another. And um, if you prefer that, you know, go for it. But I recommend having it on. It's been super helpful for me. Um, and like anything, if you right click this, it'll give you a bunch of ways of customizing its feel and performance. And um, But uh, it should be pretty good the way I have it set up. Uh, next to that is, this is your global lock for your project. Um, I basically never use this, um, but it's a way of locking down various things in the whole project. Um, I just, I don't find it terribly useful, but I do find locking to be useful, item locking. So this is global locking for the whole project, but you can item lock, like let's say um, I wanted to lock this stuff all down with command L and that'll make it so I can't move that stuff at all. And it's a toggle, so you just Command L again to unlock it, and that should be just like Pro Tools. So Command L to lock items. And basically, I just say don't mess with this global lock. Next to that is the color palette, which we already talked about. Um, does locking only affect moving items in time? Uh, it depends. Um, I think this goes into more depth than I'm able to get into right now, but you can customize the way lock performs. And in the settings, there's a way to 
tell Reaper whether or not like Ripple will affect the lock. Um, that'll make more sense when we talk about Ripple, um, but it is customizable. And finally here, this is the notepad. And this is just so cool. I, I, this is something that I want to be using more and more in my, my projects, but uh, you can leave a note on almost anything in Reaper. So uh, I already talked about project notes. So if I click here, you can see that there are different sort of areas that I can leave notes on. And so project notes is like, that's where my to-do list was. So I can look at it there. Um, you could leave a note on a track track notes. I find this not very useful personally, but like you could say this track is for music, which should be obvious, but you know, whatever. Um, you can leave a note on that track. And then when you click on a different track, the note disappears. You click on that track again, the note appears. Um, but the thing that I actually find more useful are item notes. So let's just go to item notes. Um, so one example of where you might use this is Let's say you were collaborating with someone and um, you're sort of unsure about whether or not you want to, uh, whether you like this piece of music or not. So you could click on item notes and, and have a conversation about it. This piece of music just isn't quite right or whatever and leave your initials and you could have like an, a running conversation. That would be just one example of a note. But then after I've left it, you can see how with this item, there's this little note icon. And so I can double click it and then see that note. And that note will travel with that item, even if you edit it and make you know, cuts or whatever, um, that note is now stuck to that whole item. So um, that's one way of working that I think can be interesting. And obviously you'd need to make that a part of your workflow with your collaborators. You'd have to know that like, oh, that little symbol means that someone has you know, a note for me. Um, but I actually find it more useful just like as notes to self, um, you know, like, uh, if, if there's something that I want to do that's more than um, leaving a marker, we can talk about markers next. Um, but this would also potentially be another way of um, transcribing in your tape. You could click on that and leave some transcription there. Um, or there's even a, if you click the notepad here, like extra, well, I guess that's extra project notes, not extra item notes. Anyway, you can leave notes on all sorts of stuff and that's how you do it. Alexander asks, if you split edit and then edit the note, would you get the, a separate note or would the note appear on both? You would get a separate note. The note would, be, would become a different note at that point. Anna asks, can you search in notes? Yes, you can. Um, so command F, just like you do in a text editor. So command F in Pro Tools um, creates a fade dialog. Um, I don't have that turned on here because uh, the F key by itself works just fine. Um, so if I to do a fade, I can just highlight two regions, hit F, and then I can, you know, play with the shape, you know, by moving it around or holding command, bending it, whatever. But I can do searches for those notes. So command F will open up find. And you can do searches for notes, uh, item names. Um, the item names things is kind of, is kind of cool. Like, uh, let's just say that um, I, was working in a totally different part of the, the project and I was not looking at my music at all. And I do a search for my, in this case, I'm gonna do a search for item name music because demo music is one of my item names. Um, if I do a search for it, it'll jump me right to that item. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then it mirrors that in the uh, take or media item um, folder as well. Um, so you can search for item names, you can search for any of the notes, uh, it's pretty powerful that way. So command F will search the text in all the notes. Um, I think it will, well, I think you have to specify what type of note you're looking for, whether you're looking for an, uh, an item note here, and then you could search, and I think it will search for all the notes. Um, but that would be like, we'd have to sort of play around with it, but um, I think it will. Okay, so about Ripple. Ripple is like Pro Tools Shuffle, but not like Pro Tools Shuffle. <laughs> and I'll show you why. Um, and I'll show you by going to Pro Tools for a minute. So in Pro Tools, uh, oops, there we are. In Pro Tools, you'll notice there's the, you, if you've ever used it, there's slip and shuffle mode, which is the F1 and F2 keys. 
Um, when you're in slip mode and you move an item, it just moves exactly where you'd expect it to. It moves totally freely. Um, and if I make some edits here, if I'm in shuffle mode and I make deletion, those other items just snap together like that. Reaper has something like that, and it's called Ripple. It works a little bit differently than Pro Tools Shuffle in the sense that in shuffle mode in Pro Tools, you can kind of flip the order of things. And we don't have that flippiness, but we do have some other things in Reaper. So let me just show you how it works and why it's different and why I've come to really prefer the, the Reaper version. So I'm going to do that by opening a different demo project here. First of all, just the basics. This button is your, uh, your Ripple button, and it has three modes. So whereas Pro Tools had shuffle and slip, this has three modes. Um, and I have some key commands set up to, to scroll through that. You can click on it, and if you click on this, you'll notice that there are three different icons. There's one that's gray, there's one that's blue with just a single column of boxes, and there's one with all the boxes checked. So that represents the three different modes. Um, and I also have key commands mapped to it. So um, the one key is ripple off. That's the gray one. The two key is the next one. This is called ripple per track. And then the three key is ripple all, or ripple for the whole project. And I'll show you how they work differently. Um, also, you can use the tilde key in the corner. Um, and that will scroll through the, the various modes. Or option P will do that. That's Option P is the Reaper default, I believe. Um, but the tilde key does that in, in um, Pro Tools, so I mapped that. And then also I, I did make the uh, F1 and F2 keys sort of work here. Uh, so F2 will go to ripple off, which is like slip. <laughs> and F1 will go into ripple per track, which is like shuffle. But I'm going to tell you that um, you probably only want to go between um, ripple off and ripple all and you want to skip the ripple per track. And here's why. Um, there are moments where you'd want to do ripple per track, but they're just so specific that I find myself almost never using ripple per track. So here are how the different modes work. If I'm in the one key mode, I hit my one key, that's like slip. And if I move an item around, I can move it wherever. Pretty easy. If I'm in the two mode, and it's ripple per track, and I click on something and delete it, that whole track starts to snap together. But where this is problematic, let's just say if I'm deleting this whole chunk right here, now this yellow stuff is out of alignment with the music cue that I've got, right? And this is a problem in most DAWs as well. So I'd have to think about how to avoid that. One of the ways you'd avoid it is by going into the three mode, which is ripple all. And this is the mode that treats the entire session as if it were a piece of tape. So if I click on this rose section and I delete it, watch what happens to the item below it. It creates an edit and the whole project, everything after that just snapped together on all the tracks. I find that this is a much faster and efficient way of editing across tracks, especially if you're doing something that's more than just one or two tracks. Now it does create an edit right here on the music. So like I would either need to um, if this was an ambient piece of music, I'd either need to make a fade to fix that edit, you know, so because so anything that's cut below it is potentially going to be a, a raw edge. Um, but the advantage to it is all of my music cues, all of my volume automation, everything like that is going to be preserved without any error on the other side of the edit. So the way I deal with a situation like this music edit is um, maybe moving this down um, for reference. So sorry, I'm just going to back this up. Let's just say I make an edit on this blue region. Everything slides over. And uh, now I've got an edit on this music track. I can temporarily put this down here and re-extend the region that way, create the fade, and just get rid of that item. So that's one way of doing it. And then the other way would be um, you know, creating a crossfade here. Uh, but I find that this saves me so much time because to do a similar type of thing in Pro Tools, I'd have to do um, Option Shift Enter, which is basically t saying select everything from this point forward. And then I would have to like group the tracks. So I'm doing all the functions on the same track or select all the tracks um, and then make my edit. And 
like to do the same thing in Pro Tools, it's like a two or three step move, whereas it's a one step move here. Um, and especially when I'm at the final stages of a project, when I'm like having to do like little tiny edits to something, um, I find this saves me so much time. Um, but it's not just deleting stuff, it's also adding stuff. So that's something that can happen often in a piece is that you get to a draft and then you're like, oh, actually I need to add this whole new chapter. So what I do there is I go into ripple all mode with the three key. And then I just make the space that I need to add whatever track I need to add. And it'll push all that automation. It'll push all of the, all the, all those tracks together. Um, uh, and, uh, Stephen Young says in the chat, the chat, this is a huge help for editing video with a separate audio track. I think this is actually closer to the way video editors work. Um, a lot of other video editing programs use a ripple type mode. Um, I find it to be way better uh, for, especially for narrative type work. Um, so making the space you wanna do, you can like just pretend I added a new file here. Uh, so this is my new chapter. And then now I can um, just cinch it back up and patch it back up. And uh, so it's a very fast way of both taking things away and uh, adding new things without having to worry about things getting out of alignment. Um, Anna asks, and sorry if I missed this, you can't ripple with group a few tracks, but leave one unmessed with. You can, I mean, uh, I think you can. I think you'd have to select multiple tracks at the time by, so like shift clicking. Let's just see, let's test this out together. Uh, I shift selected two tracks and I was in the ripple per track mode, I believe um, my edits will apply to both of those tracks. But it's a, it's a, a harder thing to keep track of, so to speak. Um, so you'd have to make sure, yeah. So that will work um, if, you, if you very intentionally click items on multiple tracks, you can do that ripple per track just on those tracks. Is that? Does that answer, answer the question? I'm not sure I like, got the question quite right. Yeah, well, that, that was it. Thank you, Okay, Brandon. cool. So, like I said, I think that you can do 95% of the work, if not more, by just going between that one and three mode, ripple off or slip um, and ripple all. But I'm going to try to make it even more efficient for you. So I'm going to undo a few steps. Okay. What I've been doing lately, and this is like a, a relatively new part of my workflow, is I stay in ripple off all the time. I almost never intentionally turn it on, but in the moments when I need to do a ripple all mode, I hold down the command key and then I just command drag. And so command dragging, or if you're on windows, it'll be control dragging, temporarily turns on ripple all just for while you're holding that, that button down. Um, and so that way, like I, just, I, I can also command drag and cinch things back up together again. And that's been just a huge time saver for me. Alexander asks, wait, if it's going into ripple all with you command drag, why did the music not change? Oh, okay. So watch this. So um, I'm going to ripple all temporarily with my command key and notice how this, this piece of music right here um, doesn't move. Anything that is any item that is anchored on the left side of the ripple edit is anchored like it's not going anywhere so it's not creating an edit so this is one of the advantages of ripple all mode is like you just do that every and all the stuff that's anchored to the left makes is um uh stays in place uh so that way you can create the space that you need to add your insertion or whatever um and by the way this also works with pasting too so like um if i made space let's just say I was copying this region and then I pasted it while I was in ripple all, all mode. It is also paste, it's also inserting time when you paste something. Um, so just be aware that there's a difference between pasting in ripple all or any, any of the ripple, ripple track or ripple all. When you paste in ripple mode, it will add that extra time to the, the timeline. Whereas if you're in non ripple mode, it'll just place it where you want it. I don't think that's something that I've mentioned before in my other workshops, so that's a, a good thing to know. Hey, Brendan, can I make a quick case for using single ripple mode? Yeah, go for it. So I found that um, if you're doing something like cutting a two-way or if you work 
um, if you're if you're assembling something that maybe does have some sound design, but like you are working in a context where you're putting in music before you finished cutting everything together. So like so let's say you have like a like a two, let's say you have like an like a like a like a track that's like not totally cut and a bunch of music and you're kind of like sewing it together all at the same time. You can like I'll use single track to like blaze through and like cutting out ums and uhs and stuff. And then it's like it's like kind of earlier at the at the editing phase. Yeah. But I think yeah like as the the more done in a project you get you use it less but i i think there's still plenty of reasons to use it if you're kind of like at the fast cutting phases so. totally totally i think that's a great uh mm -hmm. a great use of ripple per track um and if i'm using it it's usually when i'm in an earlier stage of of uh, editing um and it's usually like a, an interview or a two-way that i've grouped together or something like that um but the, what, what you just said actually reminds me of um Something that I haven't like explicitly demoed yet, which I think I should. I've talked about why I think Reaper is really good for collaboration, and I don't think I've totally built that case for you yet. Um, but one of the things that you can do is let's say that you are working on a team with multiple reporters, and each reporter is working on their own, you know, chapter or section or story, and you know you're in the position of having to put them all together in, in, as part of the same assembly. Uh, that's where this tabs thing comes in real handy. So for example, if I made a new tab, and uh, if you were here at the start, you know that uh, I've got this project template, my radio and podcast template project. I'm just gonna load that. So I've got kind of a blank project here. Um, and if I wanted to pretend this was a edited interview that I wanted to copy in, I could do a couple things. I could just, you know, copy, I could open their session in a tab, copy it, and, you know, find the place that I want to paste it to and paste it. Um, so that's something that's, it's like, if you were to do that in Pro Tools, you'd have to use the import project settings, um, which is, has a graphical user interface that I find not super intuitive. Um, this is just as simple as just copying and pasting. Um, but the other thing that you can do, which is really nice, especially as you're getting more built projects, is you don't have to just copy items. You can copy whole tracks. So if I click on the track and then do copy, and then I go into this and I hit paste, um, I'm getting the whole track, but also all the automation and all of the plugins that that track contained. So this is another way of getting like a lot of data um, and you can be very specific about like whether I'm getting the track with plugins or whether I just want to copy the item. So like um, if I wanted to take all these pieces of music separately, not as tracks, but as items and copy them and then paste them into my session, I'll have to make more tracks than I have here, but um, it just pastes them in without any of that plugin data, but with the automation data. So um, that's just a handy thing to know, especially if you're collaborating with folks. And that's how, um, like in the first season of Wolverine, um, it was just me and Chloe Prasinos making the whole thing. Like no one else was touching that audio. Uh, so she and I would like on our separate computers, just focus on different parts of the story and piece by piece building up and um, bringing in sections of the story. And, and um, that's how you go from something that's like small to something that has many, many tracks is uh, just layering it over time. Um, and so what you can see here, this is sort of like the mega version of the um, radio podcast template that I have where, um, you know, I've got, in this case, I have music up here and then I have a bunch of reverbs. And um, in this case, it's ambisonic dialogue. So it's four track uh, rather than stereo, <laughs> but, um, and then uh, a bunch of sound design in the sort of purple and pink areas. Sam asks, uh, do you ever use subsessions at all? Uh, which is an interesting question that I haven't talked about in any of my other workshops yet, um, but I'll just mention it without demoing it. There is a way to basically save an entire Reaper session as a sub project. Um, and if you do that, you can create what looks like an item. It's almost like a way of creating projects within projects. Um, and I find it to be a little bit problematic still for my workflow because you have to like bounce out the project each time you're making it change i don't want to get into all that right now but it's a it's an option so there's a way of 
taking a whole session and then exporting it as if it were its own item. And then if you double click the item, um, it will open up that project in a, in a new tab and then you can continue editing. And then you have to save that sub project and then those changes get pushed back to the sub project item. It's complicated and uh, I haven't made it work quite effectively enough for me, so I don't use it in my workflow yet. Nicole asks, so for moving a project between people working remotely, can you just mail or we transfer the project file? Well, uh, let me talk a little bit about how I uh, work remotely. So um, I'm doing everything in Dropbox, basically. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, file management. I guess we have that that's a, sort of a later section that I meant to get into, but we can talk about it now um, because file management and collaboration kind of go hand in hand. Um, so right now, this whole thing that I've just been demoing in front of you is an unsaved project. And so it's referencing those audio files that it currently exist in my downloads folder. Um, so in Pro Tools, it forces you to save a new project as soon as you start. Um, and then it imports the files as you, as you add them to the project and puts them in an audio files directory. The way Reaper's configured at the moment, um, it is possible to set it up to where it prompts you to save automatically. And that's a preference that I have not turned on. Um, but right now I'm in an unsaved project. So let's see what happens when we save a project. And this, I'll do a save project as. Um, and this is not the way that Reaper works by default. I've customized it to do a few important things, but let me just show you what they are. So let's say I wanna save this session in my desktop. Or tell you what, just because we're talking about collaboration, let's say I want to save it to my Dropbox. So um, I have two checkboxes here. Um, and I, as soon as I add, like if I call this demo session, this is going to create a new folder that's called demo session. And in that folder, there's going to be a Reaper RPP file that is like, that's like the Pro Tools PTX file. Um, that's the thing, the session uh, file. And then it's also gonna make a uh, audio files folder. And then because this box right here, copy all media into project is, is selected, it will copy the files from my downloads directory where I first imported them and put them, make a new copy into this audio files folder. Um, you can instead tell it to move all those files into the directory with this box, but I don't like doing that by default because um, there's a chance that you might move a file that is being referenced by another project or something like that. So I, I sort of take the more conservative approach and make a copy of the, um, the, the files. So those files always exist and travel along with the entire um, uh, project folder. So saving demo session, into my personal Dropbox. So you can see it's copying the files, it's rebuilding the peaks. And then just to prove the point, if I open my Dropbox, here's my demo session folder. I've got the demo session RPP. I've got an audio files folder. It has the two MP3s, which it did not convert to WAV. It just you know uh, is editing the, or referencing the MP3s directly. And then it also has this peaks folder, um, which is the waveform data uh, calculated for each one of these audio files. And so that way the peaks folder is, you know, you can have as many files as you want um, and, uh, and they all go, all the peaks info is saved there. Um, and that's why, again, I had that peaks folder option configured the way I, I have it. So if my collaborator goes on Dropbox, they will get the peaks data that I've already calculated and they don't have to wait that extra time to calculate it. And it doesn't take all that much time to calculate it, but if you've got a big project referencing a lot of files, or especially if the files are long interview files, it does take you know a, a bit to calculate it, um, especially if you're using the colored um, peaks mode or spectral edit or spectral, spectral peaks mode to get my terminology precise. Sorry, I'm kind of getting behind in the chat here, catching up. Uh, does this mean that multiple people can be in the same session in its own Dropbox? I would say no to that. Uh, I am very uh, obsessive about making sure that everyone, whenever they start a new project, um, saves as a new version. And so that way we get a lot of RPP files with our own initials and dates and stuff like that. 
Um, but I try to make it so we're not stepping on each other's toes. Um, but we do work out of the same Dropbox folder. So it's as if we're, we're referencing all that same data um, and we're, we're staying in sync with each other and we're just adding new RPP files or new session files and that way we're not um, having conflicts. Um, so that means that simultaneous editing isn't possible, right? Uh, yes and no. Like, yes, simultaneous, simultaneous editing is possible if you are referencing a different RPP file. Uh, if you are referencing the same RPP file, you are going to get conflicts. Um, so that's why I tell everyone to do a save as before they start, like the very first thing. Um, so otherwise, Dropbox would not work. <laughs> or it would, it would work, but it would cause problems that you wouldn't want to deal with. Um, so, uh, so when I work with folks, we are all working in our independent RPP files, but our file structure is all the same within Dropbox. I thought Pro Tools also leaves everything scattered everywhere. I don't think it does by default. Um, but uh, at least mine doesn't. <laughs> But you also can manage all these files um, uh, up here in the project directory. So I don't think I've gone through in detail with this, this media project bay, and I think I should just take a minute to do that. So this is the source media tab is just a list of all the audio files in that, in that project, not the items, but just like individual files. So you can do a ton of file management from this folder. Um, if you right click, you can do all sorts of things. You can change the name of files. You can, um, instead of doing the save as and collecting thing that I did when I was saving as, you can uh, copy the file into the project media directory here. So if you do have that kind of thing where you've scattered a bunch of files from all over the place, um, it's very easy to just select all of them and then just do copy all into uh, the project folder. Um, so I won't go into all of these, but if you explore and poke around here, almost any file management type stuff that you would be doing from the finder, uh, you could be doing within the program itself. So that's the source media uh, tab. The media items tab, this is more like your clips list in Pro Tools. So whenever I make an edit, it's adding a new item. Um, and you can see what track it's on, you can see what it's called. Um, and I have it set up so if you delete something, um, it'll retain it, meaning um, like, okay, just for an example, let's say I named this like good music. <laughs> okay, so this is, pretend this is its own music file um, and I were to delete it from the project. Good music is still in my mediums, uh, media items tab, and then I can just pop it back in like that. Is there a way to clear the inactive items when we're done and sending a file? Yes, there is. Um, so you can, uh, oops, you can organize this, you know, just the way you would with any sort of list or spreadsheet. But um, you can, one of the options is to, uh, where is it? Or maybe it's an action remove all items that are not used in the project. So that's a very quick way of doing it. Oh, I was talking about the, the different tabs in the, this section. I won't go into super detail on these later ones. The, the first two are the most important. So source media is all the files that are in your project. Um, in this case, I only have two. Uh, and then media items are all of the clips or items uh, in the session. Next is effects, if I had plugins. So I don't have any plugins on this particular project. But if I had a project with plugins, uh, it'll give me a list of all the plugins that I'm using. And I'll talk about plugins later. I haven't quite got there yet. Next is effects parameters. So this shows you whether different effect parameters are being modulated or, or not. And I, that'll also be something that'll come up in a minute. Item groups, if there are grouped objects or grouped items, um, this is where they show up. Take comps is something I haven't ever used, uh, but this is like, especially in a music setting, if you're doing like vocal comping where you're singing the same lines over again and you're picking and choosing takes between the best one. Uh, I don't really use that, so I can't explain it. Um, and automation items is also a new feature that I just won't get into for now. But um, the important ones here are the source media tab and the media items tab. 
And the media items tab is going to be the one that's closer to clips list in Pro Tools and the one that you'll probably be using more often um, unless you're doing the sort of um, file management type stuff about the individual items. Uh, Anna, I saw your hand raised. Hey, Brendan, thanks. Just a quick question. So like, so for like, so things on the screen that I don't need, like take comps, for example, like, is there an easy way to like clean up like, or the metronome, you know, can I like get rid of the things that I just won't use? Uh, yes, to some of those. Um, I don't think that we can hide the tabs on this whole section. So th all this stuff is built in. You're going to have to just deal with that. Um, you can hide individual, uh, you know, columns. So that is one thing that you could do. Um, so I have them all on because I'm a control freak and I like seeing all that data, <laughs> but uh, you don't have to. So you can hide all that. And then obviously you can change the size here. And, you know, so if you just wanted to focus on the name and nothing else, you could set it up to do that. Um, and then the metronome and stuff like that. This is a level of detail that I don't normally get into on uh, these things, but it's under, I have to look around my camera, customizing, customizing menus and toolbars. Um, and it is possible to, in this case, uh, main toolbar, where is it? Main toolbar. You can go in and, and hide and delete and add things here. So you, you can totally make it whatever you want to make it um, if you really want to get into that. Um, my philosophy was I was going to keep all that stuff there because it is sort of part of Reaper's built-in um, main toolbar, and I didn't want that to be confusing for folks who have been using Reaper for a while. Um, but that's how you do it. Alexander, did you have a question? I saw your hand up. Yep. So uh, if the timecode region is flashing yellow, is that a CPU usage warning? Uh, it, sometimes, yeah. Uh, I, I think that actually is exactly what it is. <laughs> I think okay, it can, cool. Actually, it says right here, flash transport yellow on possible audio device underrun. You'll notice it happens to me when I'm like switching projects sometimes because it's taking a little more CPU power. To yeah, 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 yeah. You know, do that. Um, but if you were pushing the limit of your computer and using a lot of plugins and it started to choke up, you would see that happening. Can I ask another question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in this one project you just showed, you have these really cool items showing a keyboard or a microphone, um, oh, like these, right. these icons. Like, how yeah. do you do them? They're cool to keep overview. So this is something that I've built into my uh, radio and podcast template, and I have them there just sort of as like um, reminders to folks what the different um, tracks are, are intended for. So like these are your, you know, things that are recorded in a studio versus these are things that are recorded in a field and, and you know, these are folder files, music files. Uh, you just, I really, it's really annoying. I have my camera like right in front of my screen where this is showing up. Um, there's a way to do that. It's under here. <laughs> this is so funny. I haven't dealt with this in my other sessions. Uh, track icon right here. You can set the track icon and uh, it will direct you to a, a grouping of different images. And so these are just different images that uh, Reaper is, has built in. Um, and you can also get rid of them. You can delete them. And if you delete all of, or if you remove all of the different Im images, um, that column will just disappear. Um, but I, I only put it there for organizational purposes. Uh, If you happen to have an iPad or an iPhone or an Android or any touchscreen device, um, without having to install anything, you can set it up as a touchable remote control in Reaper. Um, you do that by going to your preferences and then scrolling almost to the very bottom where it says control OSC web. Um, there is a web interface option and you can edit it. Um, you can, you know, make a shortcut to put your own name on it. Uh, or you can just navigate to this IP address and that'll change depending on your home network. But um, it is a touchable remote control. You can start, stop, you can um, expand tracks. So like just to prove the point, right. starting it, stopping it. Um, and if I want to, if you can watch the studio bus fader move there, I can remote control move it. 
And it's all, you don't have to install any app or anything. It's all through the web. Um, so if you want a touch screen control, you already have it on your phone, if and when you need it. <laughs> I think the next thing that I need to talk about is the track control panel. So all the stuff happening right here. Track control panel is basically the mixer, um, but like on its side. So if I bring up the mixer, you can see the different colors that I have in this session. Um, and you can see if you can imagine like tilting your head, that's what uh, that's what it looks like. Um, but then you can also see the indentations that I've made for track folders. So you can see that these two or three uh, in this case, because I just copied and pasted that in, these are all being routed into the, the parent folder above it. Um, but let's just run down what each one of these things does on. Um... So the first thing that you'll notice is that if you zoom in and out, some of the features disappear and that they dynamically kind of scale depending on uh, if you've created more space for them or not. So in its most collapsed form, if I zoom all the way out, zoom all the way out on the whole project. We just have four buttons here. This is uh, whether if you have plugins applied, this is whether the plugins are on or off globally. I'll talk more about plugins in a minute. The effects brings up an effects box that will show you what all the different plugins are. Um, so on this first track, I only have one plugin. Um, I'll talk more about the effects box in a minute. But right now, I just want to give you a demo of what is all in this section. You've got your mute and solo. I think that should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, but the Pro Tools key command for solo works. So Shift S um, if you want to just solo a specific track. Um, but as I expand, you'll notice that we get more things here. So the first is this, this is the fader. So this is like your, um, you know, and you can see on the mixer how they're, it's a one-to-one. -one. You move the fader here, you move the fader on the mixer as well. So that's another reason why I, I rarely have the mixer up is I'm doing most of my stuff from the side anyway. Um, but by the way, if you are coming from the Pro Tools world and you prefer having a, a mixer sort of floating in its own panel, um, just like anything, you can right click and undock and now the mixer is its own thing, and I can move that wherever I want it to go. I prefer having it docked um, because uh, I got to redock it. Um, I just like having it open and close as I need it. And similarly to the track control panel, as you shrink it and expand it, you see more and less features. So um, just be aware of that. Um, but I think I, I mostly don't have it open and I'm doing most of my mix stuff from the side anyway. So that's the mixer, mixer part of the con track control panel. Here, if you're an audio engineer, this is your phase or your um, polarity of waveform. So if you wanted to take something and reverse it, that's not reverse time, but reverse the polarity, uh, that's how you do it. And this one I'll talk more about in a minute, um, but this is your automation panel. So when you have things that have um, volume automation or effect automation. This panel basically is showing you all the different things that can be automated. Um, so right now on the uh, studio track, I just have the volume enabled. And, um, and by the way, uh, to bring up volume for any track, it's just the V key. So V will do that for volume, and then you can draw in your own volume automation. I'm going to actually switch to a different project for a minute. Uh, where was the one that I was messing around with earlier? Yeah, here we are. Uh, so the V key will open the volume lane and then the P key will open the pan lane if you wanna have, move things from left to right. So like so. Um, by default, it's in the center. And then if I wanted to make this voice uh, just move from left to right, I'm probably best known for my um, oh. sound design work. Um, I've always been an independent producer, freelancer. So you can um, hear how it's moving from 2006. Uh, so you can automate pan. But uh, when you get plugins and stuff, you can basically automate anything. You can automate any, any effect parameter. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But just to know that that is what this little thing that looks like an upside down 
uh, V or an, an A with little dots, uh, that shows you all the different parameters that can be um, uh, changed. Next to that, this is um, if you're recording. So this is the record button to record enable a track. Um, so if I wanted to um, record directly into this project, this button is the monitoring whether or not you hear it in your headphones or not. Um, but just to show you, uh, I can just record straight into the track. And now this microphone is recording straight into Reaper um, and la 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 la. Uh, that's how I do that. Um, this will take some extra setup if you have like a recording device or a USB audio device, and I'm not going to go into that today. Um, if that's something you want to do, you're going to have to um, explore on your own. And then uh, here is your pan. So for anyone who's used Pro Tools, uh, they are probably used to seeing two different pans. Um, if I right click it, I can change the pan type to a uh, dual pan and then get those separate left and right pans for for you know per track i personally don't like working that way having two pans so instead i have it set up um, as a stereo pan and what that means is um, if i turn off my automation here because right now i automated pan um, this will move things to left and right just as it would on the mixer and then this thing right here is the width so um, and this is one of the reasons i like setting it up this way is if i had a piece of say stereo music like this um i can i really need to move this camera this is just no good i'm gonna stand by <laughs> if i had a um a stereo file and i wanted to start collapsing it and making it more mono this is how i'd do it so um i can change this knob and as it gets more towards the center it's moving those left and right sides into the center and making it more mono and then if i pull it past the center then it reverses the stereo image so this is a level of control that you just don't have in a lot of other editing platforms and um, i really like it for that reason uh to answer your question alexander there is not a built-in binaural version as there is in logic that's uh i think that's something that i only know of in in logic um, you can do that with plugins and stuff, but uh, that's not built in. And then below here, this is um, where you would have if you had a plugin. So if I click effects, and let's just say I want to add in one of Reaper's built in EQ plugins, which is called Re EQ. I did that really fast. Let me slow that down a little bit. I click FX, that's going to open up uh, the effects window. This is where I get to put in the different plugins and effects that I want to use. I hit add. And then just like everywhere else where you've got these filter things, you can search for plugins. So um, I did a search for REAEQ, and then it just popped me to the plugin that way because I knew that that was the one I wanted to add. But let's say I wanted to add a third party plugin like um, Isotope's Dialog Denoiser is one that I use all the time. So if, it's actually called Voice Denoise now. So Voice Denoise, and then it will you know, limit me to just those options. And then I can add the voice denoiser from there. And I would usually put that before any EQ. The voice denoise is like the very first thing that I would have running. Um, and then uh, you can also search based on uh, like the developers, like who makes the plugin. Uh, you can search categories of the plugin. So if you're looking for something that's just an EQ or, you know, um, dynamic related, uh, it can group it by category. Um, but oftentimes, like EQ is built into the plugin name. So if I just do EQ like that, um, then it will show me all the plugins that have that those words or those letters EQ in them. So now that I've got these two plugins uh, installed on the track, you can see that they show up here. So I can double click them here and I can pop them out as their own their own. Uh, interface. Um, and then also when I go into automation here, now you can see that I have two instances, uh, one for the denoiser, one for the uh, EQ. And when you want to start automating um, different things for sound design reasons, this is how you'd start to get into that. Um, and I'll demo that in my template in a minute. So that is the track control panel, which, like I said, is basically a mirror of what is happening in the mixer panel. Um, and there are some extra options if you want to customize 
uh, how these tracks look. Like even on a track by track basis, you can stretch them and you can make them bigger or smaller. Uh, you can change their layout. You can change what types of controls are you know showing up. So you can really customize it quite a bit. So Newer asks uh, how you open the volume. That's just the V key. So whenever you click on a track and hit V, that will open the volume automation for that track. But maybe now is a good time to talk about automation. So the, the first, you know, very most basic type of automation that you would probably be working with is, is volume automation. And I'm going to use two words kind of interchangeably here. One is uh, automation and the other is envelope. And automation is basically the... Uh, the process of like what what like a thing being automated, an envelope is uh, the actual like dots and lines. So this is your envelope, and in Pro Tools, uh, you'd have to when you do your volume automation, different tools will change what you know what types of uh, what you're able to do. And because we don't have tools in the same way as Pro Tools, our automation works just a little bit differently. So let me talk about um, how that works. So let's just pretend in this session that I wanted to make a little assembly. Oops, I didn't want to delete all of them. I'm just going to delete some of these, expand this back out. Um, I'm going to make a little assembly where it's just like me talking. Um, and then I'm going to have uh, the music below it. And I'm going to automate the volume of the music. So uh, it's just dipping down while I'm talking. So I hit the V key to bring up the volume panel here. And then if you just click, you can double click to make a point or you can shift click to make a point. That's two ways that you make dots. Typically what I'll do, especially if I'm moving fast, is I'll just make four dots, two at the front, two at the back, and then I'll just pull down the middle section and just get sort of get myself started that way and kind of rough in what level I'm looking at. And um, I haven't yet talked about loudness and stuff, but when I do, um, what I'm going to recommend is like when you're, when you're trying to make a piece of music, um, I, I typically pull the music down by about 12 decibels. Uh, and I'll talk more about how that works in regard to loudness in a moment. But just keeping our attention on automation for the time being. I make those two dots. And then I'm just going to expand this so you can see it a little bit clearer. Uh, and then I create space for myself that way. Um, if I wanted to, I could make many more dots and start to sort of change the shape and, uh, and get like a more gentle curve or something like that. Um, however, what I often do is I just stick with the, the two basic, just two dots. And then I hold down the Option key. Um, and then I can bend like that. Um, so this is a really nice way of without having to do a bunch of you know, drawing, you can make things that have a very smooth, nice, um, nice curve like that. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll just do like a couple points and then I'll uh, use the option key to kind of like make it one that bends one way, one that bends the other way. And, and that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is right clicking, just like you can right click everything and you can change the, the shape here. So it's really quite customizable. Uh, another thing that you might do is you might just want to draw. So to draw, you'd hold down the command key, and then you can just draw that way, like that. Um, and then if you have a bunch of stuff drawn, you can even uh, right click on the track and do reduce number of points, and then you can kind of have it smooth out. If you've made too many points, you can kind of have it make a more abstracted version or get more detailed that way. Um, but importantly, you can copy and paste, like as long as you're um, on the envelope track, if you select points and hit copy, and then you click and paste, you know, it'll copy and paste. If you want to clear it all, I just do a select all and then delete them. Um, so that works really fast and intuitively. So that's automation. Um, are, are there any questions about just automation, um, like how it works? I'll get into talking about automating specific effects in a minute, but. Um, hey, Brendan, do you mind if I just announce the um, office hour things that, I, that we were talking about before? Because I, I might have to hop off. Yeah, sure. 
so Sam is uh, well. Sam will take it from here, um, but uh, has an offer. Has an offer for the group. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just real quick. Um, I. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, like, I, I, I've I've had the benefit of getting <clears throat> some of this training from Brendan like years and years ago. Um, and but I'm certainly learning a ton now and things that he has certainly learned um, over the years. Um, I, in sort of in the same spirit of trying to offer stuff to the radio community, I'm um, going to be announcing that I'll be holding um, basically like office hours or whatever that basically if, if there's anything that like in this session that either you missed or or wanted to go over or maybe you saw now and we're like, wait, how did he, how did he do that? Not that I can necessarily replicate anything that Brendan does to his caliber, but um, but I I'm I'm gonna uh, I, I'm willing to do like one-on-one -on -one, um, sessions with folks for free. Um, the uh, address um, I'm still getting it set up, and I'm still learning how to use it. I'll put it in the um, text box in a minute, but the comments box. But basically, it's um, it'll just be Calendly dot um, so Calendly dot com slash Sam Greenspan. So. Let's put that here, calendly.com slash Sam Greenspan. And I just like basically pick some windows for time. Um, anyone, anyone can book it. We can talk about engineering can also, and, and sound production. We can also, I mean, if you also have other things in radio related, I'm happy to talk about those too, to the best of my ability. Um, so uh, I, because I'm still learning the platform, I just pick like Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, and and the afternoons that I'm on Pacific time, which I know not, might not work for some folks, but um, so if basically I'm just saying if there if you would like to like have an hour with me, but you I don't you don't have a time we don't have time in common, just email me and I'll put um, this is my email address um, and um, just just get at me and, and we'll find a time that works. Um, yeah, and that's that's uh, and I know some folks are starting to hop off, and I wanted to make sure people knew that I was going to be offering that. And I'll I'll, I'll write about this on the um, the listeners and stuff too. So um, with that, I'll get back to Brendan. Thanks. Awesome, and thank you, Sam, for. Uh, <laughs> I I I was talking to Sam uh, earlier and saying like this is my last session that I've been doing these for a while, and like I'm looking to, forward to taking a little bit of a break from them. Uh, um, I enjoy teaching a lot, but uh, but. I, I am getting a little bit tired <laughs> as well. So I'm very thankful and grateful to Sam for continuing to, uh, um, you know, uh, to keep, keep doing this kind of, uh, giving back to the community. Cause yeah. And I'm inspired to pick up by, you know, by the momentum that you've started with this. And I think it's, I think it's good to see, um, you know, people who've been in the field for a while, um, make space for, um, for either people who are starting out or who haven't like been able to access these resources before. So, um, to the extent that I can, I'm happy to help. Great. I hope that many more folks follow in, in your, uh, in your footsteps, Sam. Um, all right. So pivoting back to Reaper, I think at this point I should talk about my template and I should talk about loudness. Um, so I'm going to do that through my template. So if you want to follow along. Um, what I'm going to suggest doing first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the two tracks that I've got here. I'm going to take these items and I'm going to put them in um, this new session that I'm about to make. Um, so I'm going to select them, hit copy, and then go to new project tab. Getting a lot of project tabs <laughs> going on here. And then I'm going to pull up my template. So going up to file and uh, project templates and Brendan's radio and podcast template. And by the way, I was talking about um, what a note would look like if you have a note saved with a project. This is how it would feel. Um, I just have a note basically saying like, this is my template and um, you know some information and like the date and stuff when I made it. But you can just hit OK and then that'll cancel it or clear it. But if you wanted to collaborate with someone with a project note, that's what that would look like. And then I'm just going to paste those two items that I just made. So this is my voice and this is my music. And I'm going to put them down into their respective areas. So you can see I have different colored zones for different types of things. And I have two tracks per zone, but uh, if you wanted to like have more music tracks, what I would just recommend is copying the track and pasting and then calling it music three instead of music two. So that's how you do it. Um, and... Let's see, I'm gonna put this just on studio one. 
So let's talk about loudness. Can I just get a show of hands maybe? Um, how many of you are familiar with like LUFS or LUFS? So a handful of you. Um, I'm gonna give kind of like just a very quick definition. Um, normally when we talk about uh, volume, not normally, but often when we're talking about sound level in audio production, we're using decibels. And decibels are like a very scientific, very precise measure of sound energy at a given moment. Um, and so they're measured from, you know, zero in the digital realm, they're, they're measured at zero at the sort of highest possible sound, loudest possible sound to negative infinity. Um, and because they're so precise, they actually don't give us the best understanding of loudness. Um, so loudness, if you th think about it as like, if I, you know, clapped my hands, you know, that is a very quick sound, but I don't necessarily feel it as loud. Um, whereas if I had a, a sound that was maybe not the same decibel level, but happening very consistently, like, I don't know, an air conditioner might be an example. An air conditioner has a certain loudness to it because it's a consistent sound. And so this measure, LU or LUFS or LUFS, I'll, I'll say all of those things, um, they are basically a way of averaging averaging decibels over a particular window, a window of time. So um, if I every three seconds was taking a rolling average of what my decibels were, that's kind of like what LUFs are. Um, LUFs have some additional things that are meant to compensate for the way that we perceive sound. So um, sounds, we, we are very sensitive to certain like mid-range frequencies and our ears hear bassy and trebly sounds differently. Um, so uh, LUFS has some of that sort of built into its algorithm. But the, the basic thing that you need to know is that LUFS are a way of averaging sound over time. Um, and that when we are delivering a podcast mix, oftentimes um, this is sort of, there's a, a, an industry momentum around um, mixing to say like negative 18 uh, LU. Different, different uh, platforms will have different loudness specs. So like I think Spotify wants it at negative 14. Um, I used to recommend that people mix to negative 16. Um, but this is basically an average loudness over the course of a whole project. Um, but the interesting thing about LUFS is that they do scale to decibels. So if you had a mix that was negative 24, um, all you have to do is raise it, you know, uh, 23, 22, 21, 20, uh, 19, 18, you have to raise it six <laughs> to, uh, to bring it up to negative 18. So there's a relationship between decibels and loudness units. The reason why loudness units are important in terms of our mixing um, is that I teach people to mix their dialogue so they're trying to reach a loudness of negative 23 LU. Um, and negative 23 is for a few reasons. One is it's one of the standards in television, 23, 24. Um, it uh, also gives us a certain amount of headroom. So uh, if someone laughs, um, there's a little bit of space to have people get louder for a moment. Um, and that also has, that, that will also um, affect how it uh, works with our, um, our compressors and limiters and stuff like that. But the important information is that I ideally want to mix my dialogue so I'm getting an average loudness of negative 23. And there's a way that I do that in my template. So if you open up the master fader here, you can see I have some effects built in on the top right here. I can either click them directly or I can click this effects box. But um, the first one is this Yulene loudness meter. So I'm just going to open it up on my other screen, bring it back here. I'm going to open it up as its own thing. Um, and I'm just going to play the, this, this file that I brought in before I did any adjustment to it, just on its own. If I play it, let's just play it and see what happens to the logs. I've been a consultant on various projects. Um, I teach lessons sometimes. A couple years ago, I directed Marvel's Wolverine podcast. So, and I also did the sound design for that. So you can see I'm getting um, a, an integrated loudness of negative 18. Um, integrated means the average from when I started and when I ended. So the average from that whole 
bit that I just sampled is negative 18. So this is kind of loud uh, for, for in terms of mixing, um, mixing in our session. So this is one of the, the big advantages to these SWS extensions that I had you install at the very beginning. Um, if you click on an item and hit the N key, it will automatically loudness normalize the, the item and it will loudness normalize it to negative 23 LU. So it's automatically making an adjustment and getting that item at the volume level that we want it to be. Um, and this is really powerful because it will make different adjustments on different items. So if I ran it on my music, um, it will, it's so you can see here, it's turning down the music by negative seven or negative 7.66 decibels. And it turned down my voice by negative 4.11 decibels. Um, now, if I, I, I always tell people to loudness normalize your items before you start editing them. Like the very first thing, you put in a, a file, run this n command, and it's gonna loudness normalize. And that way you know for that whole interview, if, you, if this was like an hour long interview, it's already getting your levels in the ballpark. Um, and so this, uh, to answer your question, um, Hannah or Hannah, sorry if I mispronounce your name, um, the, it is loudness normalizing for each individual item. So not for the whole session. That said, when I open up this loudness normalizer, or sorry, uh, loudness meter, <laughs> this is a reading of the whole session. Because it's on the master track, it's getting a measure of everything that's happening in the whole session, right? Um, but the actual process that I'm running, the loudness normalization is happening on an item by item uh, basis. So it's just N. Um, N is the key command. There's no, uh, no other thing you have to do. Um, and this piece of audio that I've imported is, um, it's already been mixed. So it's, you can see that it's like pretty consistent throughout, but just to show you what this would look like um, with a piece of audio that hasn't been mixed, I'll just import this. Uh, you can see here that there's a lot more variation in the, the level. Like this section right here is a little bit quieter this one at the very end. So something that I do sometimes is I will make splits where sentences occur, basically, or phrases occur. And then I'll run loudness normalization, and it will independently adjust the loudness for each item. So this is a way of saving a ton of mix time. Um, rather than having to go into your volume and making adjustments and stuff like this, this thing alone is getting you in that ballpark right out of the box. Now. Like any process that's automated, there are potential dangers to it, potential pitfalls. Let me show you one of them. Let's say I had an item that was just room tone. What do you think is going to happen? So if I play this. It's smooth, clear audio. It's going to change the loudness of just the room tone and make it loud. So it's going to sound like noise. Um, so you need to be aware that that's a potential issue. Um, and one of the ways that I avoid that, apart from just like not running that process on room tone, um, is if I were to do that, and I am noticing it while I'm playing audio, I can see that, well, this item right here had to be boosted by 2.4 decibels. Excuse me, boosted by 2.4 decibels. This one was boosted by 40 decibels. So uh, I want to reset it. So the key command to reset on the Mac is control shift right arrow um, and then this is the same key command as on pro tools control shift up and down will adjust the level of items individually so because i know that this is 2.4 i can just bring this up to two or three and it will be pretty close the other thing that i tell people at this stage is um if you have a jump in volume of more than like three decibels, it's potentially problematic. I, I find that about three decibels is where my ear starts to notice that the volume has been adjusted. So um, li just like when I do my dialogue editing elsewhere, um, I like creating um, fades when I'm doing this kind of thing. So either by selecting and hitting F and doing a fade that way, um, or uh, the other way of doing it would be to just pull an item into the, its neighboring item like that. Sure. Um, the other thing that you can do is 
try to sort of, if you have a big jump between, you know, negative two and plus six or whatever, you can make a split and then try to sort of step up in groups of no more than three. And that's another way of kind of like uh, hiding those adjustments. But um, the big thing is, you know, with natural speech, you are going to have moments where someone is um, speaking more quietly or more loudly. And I do want to have some of that variation. Um, but uh, this is a way of sort of on a phrase by phrase level, being able to get your items in the ballpark and thereby reducing the amount of work that you have to do at the mix stage. In Pro Tools, uh, what I'm doing right here, adjusting sort of clip by clip or item by item, that would be called clip gain in Pro Tools. Um, and there are a couple of ways of even going a level further. So um, I'm individually adjusting with this control shift up and down the decibel level of each individual item like that. That's how I can make something really big. And like I said, control shift and right arrow will reset it. And then you can always run the N process over it again. Um, and just one note about the automated N loudness normalization. Like if it sounds bad, it is bad. If it sounds good, it is good. You know what I mean? Like if you're hearing it make adjustments that feel funky to your ear, uh, that's a sign that you should um, maybe reset it and look at its neighboring regions and, and um, as a reference. One thing that is potentially problematic is like if you were to do that function on a very small item, it can overcompensate sometimes because, because loudest units are an average, if you're not able to average very much stuff, it, it's going to change the reading. So um, in this case, you can see that this one is negative five, this one's plus three, this one's negative one. So like in that scenario, I'd be like, okay, well, it's probably somewhere in the middle. And then I would listen that to it. your audio device. So just use your ear. Ultimately, this is not, it's a shortcut um, and it's not meant to replace the act of mixing, but it's made to make mixing more efficient is that's the way I think about it. Um, the other thing that I'll just point out is uh, with our V key, the volume uh, line, because you have already made all these adjustments here, uh, it really, I think, makes it unnecessary to do much adjustment on the volume line. And it frees us up to think about this volume as a creative decision, as a balanced decision between music and voice. So if I wanted to fade out my voice, that's an instance where it might make sense for me to use volume automation. But when it comes to like doing corrective type adjustments, uh, I try to do as much of that as possible on the item itself. And this is true when I work in Pro Tools as well. I try to do that with Clip Gain. Um, and there are practical and technical reasons for that. Um, the practical reason is I th just think it's cleaner. Um, I think it's like more, and I, I just think it's more efficient to work this way personally. Different people will have different philosophies about this. But the technical reason for it is adjusting the volume here is the very first modification to that audio item that will happen. So the order of operations in terms of mixing is first, there's the item volume adjustment. Then it runs through whatever plugins are on the track. Then after that, that's when your volume line comes in. So your volume stuff is happening after the plugins. So for that reason, I think it makes a lot more sense to balance out your clips before the plugins. That way, things like compression are, uh, they're responding to things that are in kind of already leveled out and balanced. The compressor is working less hard than it would be otherwise. Um, and then, like I said, the volume line here is something that you can kind of save for intentional creative decisions or balancing between music and voice. Um, but let me just take this one level further. So like I said, V is the volume envelope for the track. Shift V is a volume envelope for the item. So uh, I can also go in, and if there's like a particular moment that just happens to be unusually quiet, even after doing loud disnormalization, I can just bump it up a little bit. And you can see that my waveform is changing in response like that. So this way, you can still do like micro corrective type stuff on the item itself, have it run through all its plugins. Um, and uh, so shift V is the way you do that. By the way, um, since P is the pan for the track, 
shift P is pan for the item. So you can have shift V and shift P on. And so for people who are doing like specific sound design stuff, you can really start to, um, you know, do some of your design even on the item itself before it even gets into, uh, into the track. Um, and this is jumping the gun a little bit, but command shift, command shift E. The same way that we had this envelopes dialog for all of our tracks, this is all of our plugins, all the things that we can change here. Command Shift E does that for the item itself. And you can see there's also this pitch lane. So I can also control the pitch from the individual item. So just this is like, we wouldn't do this in most radio contexts, but for sound design. Um, um, well, it sounds like smooth clear. Oh, no. So you can play with that. Um, Command Shift E is the way to do that. Uh, eventually, you can also add individual VSTs to items themselves. So in addition to putting plugins on a track, you can put plugins on an item. So uh, that's a really efficient way if you are doing like DSing or something like that. You don't have to have a DSer on the whole track. You can just have it on an item. And that plugin is only running, you know, in that specific moment, which is kind of like it gives you the same kind of functionality as like Audio Suite does if you use Pro Tools. But unlike Audio Suite, it's non-destructive. So it's not creating a new file. And all of this, this whole thing, like my whole workflow is to try to be as non-destructive as possible. I always want to try to reference the original file whenever I can. Um, so I'll put effects on individual items. Or if I have to denoise something that in just one moment, that's one way I'll, I'll deal with it. Um, and uh, and that way, I'm not like having to create new files every time I want to do a little bit of cleanup. Um, anyway, I can show that more in a moment. But let's just go back to talking about. Um, I, I will show how to put a VST on an item in a minute, but I'm just not quite there yet. Um, I want to keep talking about loudness. So let's say I'm going to just use this little one piece that I just brought in. Um, yeah, select it, move it. I'm going to make a little assembly here with music and voice. And the idea, my intention in this little thing is to have the music come up, have it duck down while the voice is speaking, have the beat of the music drop as soon as my voice is done and then fade out. So I'm just going to make a little sequence like that. Um, whoop, on solo. I am going to run the loudness normalizer on the piece of music too. The reason for that is I want it to be that where when um, when the when when the music is in the clear, when it's not having any competition with the voice, uh, I would like that music to be at the same loudness level as the voice. Does that make sense? Um, so by loudness normalizing the music before you do any sort of volume adjustment or anything like that, I know that when my volume is at zero, it's as loud as it should be. And then anything after that, all I have to do is just subtract. Um, so it's a way of taking some of the guesswork out of, um, out of your, your volume mixing of between music and voice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the volume dip down just while the voice is happening. And I'm going to dip it down by, uh, 12 decibels and 12 decibels is sort of the general target. Once I've done this loudness normalization, once I know that they're basically at the same loudness. 12 decibels is a, a relatively good rule of thumb for uh, if you want it to sort of be in that bed mode, like you want the music to just be present um, and not overpowering, but you still want it to you know, exist. So let's just listen to that. So I'm going to fade in. I could also do the fade from the volume, but I'm just going to do it on the item. Fade in, it dips down, the voice speaks, uh, and then it dips back up. And then I want to have the beat drop right when music is done. Your audio. Okay, well, I'm, I 
kind of already nailed it, but like if I if it I didn't have the beat drop happen where I want it to, I could shift it with the shift um, slide function. So let's just do that. And then I'm going to have the loudness meter. And remember that I said that the automatic loudness normalization is trying to get to a negative 23 LU level. So let's just see how close I got with this kind of very rough and dirty mix. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper and that you're hearing this successfully without any glitches or pops um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. So you can see I was pretty much dead on that 23 line the whole time. So this automatic loudness normalization is just super powerful and saves so much time. Um, that and also just knowing that like taking things about 12 decibels lower is a good ballpark for like what your general level is going to be. And then when, when you have it at zero, it's going to be at its full uh, appropriate loudness. Um, now, you remember how I said that uh, a podcast mix, a lot of folks are producing podcasts to have a final mix of negative 18, and this is negative 23. So what I've done here on the master fader, if I look at the effects that I've got, so I've got the Yulin loudness meter, Yulin loudness meter, that's a tongue twister. Um, I've got a multi-band compressor, which I'm not gonna talk about. It's basically, if anyone is an engineer and knows how to use this, it's configured in a very neutral way where it's basically not doing a ton right now, um, but it's just sort of there for people who wanna do a level of multi-band compression on their master fader. I'm not gonna really talk about it. The important thing to talk about is this, the, the limiter, the master limiter. And what this is doing is it's both saying, uh, don't exceed a certain level, but it's also pushing up the, the level of the whole mix to get us from negative 23 to uh, negative 18. And this is just kind of math. So like um, this threshold is boosting the whole mix by seven, and then it's creating a, a limit or a ceiling at negative two. So like 23 uh, plus seven minus two, like it, 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 the math adds up. So it's getting us to negative 18. Um, so just to show if right now the loudness meter is happening before the limiter, if I were to copy this and make a new instance of the loudness meter and put it after, um, let's just sort of compare how the before and after look. So this is the after and this is before, and let's just play that same sequence. You can see how it's different. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper and that you're hearing this successfully without any glitches or pops um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. So we pretty much nailed it um, and nailed it without a lot of uh, futzing. So just to be aware, that is why I tell people to mix to negative 23, then let the limiter do what the limiter needs to do. Um, if you, because there are some radio stations that ask for a negative 23 or 24 mix. And so that, this way you can always give them that mix. Or if you had, if you're making something that went for TV and you wanted to get a negative 23 or 24. Um, and by the way, like if it were 24 were the spec and not 23, you would just, uh, you would just lower it by one decibel. And that would be how you'd achieve that. Um, so I tell people to mix to 23, mix your dialogue to 23, mix your music around your dialogue, um, and you should be pretty much good to go at that point. Um, sometimes sound effects will go above that momentarily, but that's usually fine um, as long as you have like a, a limiter preventing you from, you know, blowing things up. Uh, the important thing is that your dialogue be mixed to that negative uh, 23 level. So the loudness normalization is one component of this, um, but uh, I think at this point I can start to, um, for everyone who's still with me, talk about the individual plugins that are on this template and what they're doing and how they're doing some additional uh, polishing and, and um, 
they're helping us get that level and they're doing some other things. So let me just give you a tour uh, of this template. So as you can see, I've got these child tracks under a parent track. So everything that's happening in the studio tracks is being routed into the studio bus. And then if I were to mix down the studio bus and make sure that I'm also affecting the volume of everything below it. Properly in Reaper. Uh, the reason that I do that is, uh, well, what should become clear when I start to talk about the plugins. Um, the way that I create the, uh, the, those buses again is either with this little, um, I'm just going to do it on new tracks. I'm going to make some new tracks here. I'm going to take them out of the out of the arrangement. Uh, if you hit the folder button, that'll make everything underneath it sort of nestled underneath that folder. In this case, it's taking my whole project. Uh, I kind of didn't want to do that. Let me put this down at the bottom. Um, and then I hit this folder and now it's making the track beneath it routed underneath. That's one way of doing it. And then the other way of doing it is just by reordering the tracks and kind of pushing it um, indented. So like in and up and, and, and when that line is indented a little bit, then that track becomes uh, a child track to that parent track. Um, so on the child track for the studio space, uh, I had different spaces for studio and actuality. And the idea behind this is that um, things that are in the studio space, if you don't have access to a, a full treated studio, I have some plugins on it that are doing some things to polish it up and make it feel as if you're in a more dead kind of studio environment. So let's just look at what they are. Um, and those plugins are not quite the same on the actuality bus. So I'm gonna click effects on studio one. You'll notice that studio one and studio two have um, their own independent chain of effects and they're identical right now, but they're, they're identical, but they're working independently from each other. And let me just uh, go through what they are. So I can also see this if I wanna expand the track, you can see these are all the different plugins here. And if I looked on my mixer, they're also available right here. And some of them even have some ways of adjusting directly from the mixer if you wanna do it that way. But I typically do all of my adjustments directly on the plugins themselves. Um, so I've got four plugins and they're in a serial order. So they start from the top and then they route progressively downward. So the very first thing that's happening is Reaper's built-in sort of denoiser. Um, and if anyone's used Isotope's dialog denoise or um, spectral denoise, this is sort of Reaper's free built-in version of that. It definitely does not work as well as Isotope's stuff, but I included it on this um, template because it's free. Um, so if you don't have access to those plugins, which can be expensive, uh, although they do have like a an Isotope Elements version, which is like 29 bucks and like totally worth it. Um, but uh, the voice denoiser plugin by Isotope, I think is just magical. Um, but this is the Reaper's built-in version. And what it's doing is it's basically learning what the, um, the, the sound of the room tone is and then subtracting that from, uh, from the audio. So the way you do that is finding a little piece of just room tone like this. I'm gonna hit the C button. I haven't talked about C yet, but C creates a time selection. So you can make a time selection up here by um, drawing on the ruler or by drawing on the top of an item. But if you wanted to get a time selection exactly to the item, you just hit the item and then hit C. And it, I think of that as a cycle. It's creating a cycle around it. Um, that's not a Pro Tools shortcut, but it's one that I think I took from Logic. Uh, so uh, C, and then it's just because I have my loop button on right here, It'll loop that. Let me just not, I'm going to turn off the music. I'm going to solo just this one bit. And you can see I'm just looping the room tone by itself right now. And so I'm going to hit reset on this plugin. And where it says automatically be, uh, build noise profile, I'm clicking that and it's adjusting this red line to the sound of that specific uh, room tone. So then I uncheck it. I only need to do it like once or twice and then it's, it's learned it. Um, and then from this point forward, it's basically screening out that noise from any of the audio that is it's being fed. 
Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly. And, re and you know, it doesn't sound as good as Isotope, like I said. Um, you, I, I tend to hear it sort of doing its noise reduction thing um, more when it's getting to the very uh, kind of the, the bottom edge, like when it's fading to nothingness. That's where I start to hear some like garbliness. Um, if you think it's on too aggressively, you can, where it says, uh, command moves all you can command click and turn the line down a little bit and that'll make it less aggressive um so just know that that's possible anyway that's what this plugin is doing is it's uh um it's screening out the noise of the the, the room tone after that we have a um what is if you're an engineer it's it's called downward expansion um you might be familiar with the, a, a gate, and a gate will basically say uh, only let signal through when someone's talking and turn it off completely when someone's not talking. Um, I typically find that gating sounds pretty bad. So instead, what I've done here is in order to create that very dead sort of recorded in a studio style um, feeling, I've done what's called downward expansion. And what that means is when someone's not speaking, instead of turning it off, just turn it down a little bit. Um, and it's configured in a way where if you've done that loudness normalization, it should be pretty well configured where uh, it, you don't probably have to do anything to change the settings on this. It should just work. Um, but this plugin and the noise reduction thing happening together can take something that's recorded in a less than ideal room and make it really feel much more as if it's been recorded in a studio. Um, it won't work for everything. Like you still want to be close to your mic. You still want to get a good recording. But, um, but, like in my room, I do have some treatment, as you can see. Uh, but I have a window in front of me, and um, when I have this set of plugins on, it really it just gets rid of all the background and stuff. Um, and like most corrective things, uh, if you if you hear it working too much, then it's working too much. <laughs> you know, then you should turn it off and maybe go back to something that's more neutral and you can selectively turn them on and off with these little check boxes here. Um, but you can actually kind of watch the downward expansion happening. So you can see uh, basically whenever the audio is lower than this level, it just turns it down a little bit. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper and that you're hearing this successfully without any glitches or pops um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. Um, so looking at the chat, how to get these plugins again, these should all be built into the template that, uh, that I have installed with the thing. Um, and again, to get that template, it's just file, project templates, Brendan's radio and podcast template. Um, but to see them, you click the effects box right here, and then that'll bring up this old dialogue, which you can see all the effects in one, uh, in one window. And then is there a command to reset the plugins? Uh, there isn't. That's an interesting idea though. Um, you know what I could do in a future version of this is I could save each one of these settings as a preset and then um, I could have it like load to its default state. Um, that won't work right now, but that's an interesting idea for me to consider. So thanks for that. All right, so noise reduction, downward expansion, uh, downward expansion, and then we have EQ. And if you've used EQ before, you can see I'm not doing a ton right here. Um, I'm basically doing some high pass filtering, which basically means I'm letting the high frequencies pass through and I'm filtering out the low frequencies. Um, and I'm doing that at 75 Hertz. So um, it's not doing a ton. It's just meant to screen out the really like low thumpy P pop that kind of stuff or rumbles or hitting the table or that kind of stuff. Um, and then I have a little tiny, like one decibel bit of trebly kind of um, uh, enhancement, but I'm really not doing much. But then all these other points are kind of there for common uh, trouble spots or places that you might want to color. So if you wanted to enhance the bass or turn down the bass, that's point two. So you can boost and lower the bass on point two. Um, point three is like a low mid kind of like that quality to audio. So if, if you were noticing that kind of muddiness, um, some people, I've heard people call it wooliness, uh, hairiness, uh, 
Um, but I think of it as mud. If it's if you've got some mud in your voice, what I recommend is you just pull it down a little bit. And I don't pull it down much more than three or four decibels. You can see down there. Um, and then I have these turned off. You can enable each point with this little checkbox here. But I have buttons at um, 1K and 2K, which uh, you might potentially just turn up a little bit for clarity. But uh, for the most part, I try to keep things pretty flat um, unless there's a specific problem that I'm trying to uh, address. So that's the EQ. And then lastly, it's going through a, a layer of compression. And um, compression is a way of smoothing out the dynamics uh, uh, in a in, uh, signal. And I've set it in a way where it's really not doing a ton. It's mainly only there to like if someone laughs or coughs or like, you know, it's catching kind of those more transient momentary kinds of things and just turning those down a little bit. Um, but if you're an engineer, uh, I can just tell you what some of the specs are here. Uh, it's a ratio of two to one. Um, and it is set up as a peak meter, not an RMS or a peak peak. It's sen sensitive to peaks and not RMS level. So it's getting things pretty quickly. Uh, and it's a pretty fast attack uh, and average release. So it's and the threshold is at negative 10. And what I find that when once you've already done this automatic loud disnormalization stuff, uh, with these settings, you should be getting uh, a gain reduction of like two decibels, maybe three at the most. Here's just a little bit of test audio right to make sure this that you your how much it's audio device by. drivers are configured properly in Reaper and that you're hearing this successfully without any glitches or pops um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. So that's the idea behind it. Um, and then because this is a child and parent track, uh, you can see that these two things are then being routed to the studio track or the studio bus track which has one last compressor, which is, um, if you're an engineer, this is an RMS-based compressor. So it's taking things down a little bit more. It's averaging things out a little bit more. Um, and the idea here is that you can have two voices on these two different Studio One and Studio Tracks, Studio Two Tracks, and um, they're independently going through their own set of denoisers and uh, downward expansion and EQ and um, and compression. And then at one last stage, they're going through the same level of compression together. So that that, that would gel those two, um, those two tracks together a bit. So that's the studio space. And, you know, if you happen to have a studio and you're recording things that already are recorded well, you could either just decide to turn off the noise reduction stuff and the gating or the downward expansion. But I would also say that, uh, the um, the these two things are set in a way where if you are recording in a nice space, it's not going to hurt things that are recorded in a nice studio either. It's meant to just screen out the bad stuff and, and let the good stuff through. So if you've got a well-recorded um, track, it should be fine. That's the idea, at least. OK, you can see that on the actuality bus, I don't have plugins on the child tracks. I only have plugins on the bus track. And the idea behind this conceptually is that I want, if I'm, the actualities might be a collage of things coming from many different places or sources, and I want things to kind of gel a bit. Um, now, if I did have a piece of audio that needed some specific EQing and correction, I would still do that. I would still add that separately on each one of these tracks. Um, but, uh, the, all the plugins that I have pre-configured in this template are meant to be uh, happening at that top layer, and they're all about trying to get things sort of sitting well together. So you can see it's a similar type of layout to what I've got on the studio tracks. There's a, a denoise thing here. Um, there is a downward, there's that same plugin, but I have it turned off because I basically don't like using this plugin on things that are not intended to sound like they're in a studio, but it's just sort of there for reference. I've got another EQ, and you can see I've shaped it slightly differently. I'm doing a little bit more aggressive high-pass filtering. I'm doing a little bit of low-pass filtering, so also screening out some of the very high frequencies as well. Um, and then adding some of that mud reduction in the 250 hertz range. Um, and uh, just the idea is that anything going through this 
plugin is going to have that same level of treatment. Um, and then I've got a fast compressor with the same kind of settings as I've got on the studio bus. And then I've got a slow compressor with the same kind of uh, settings as well. It's just all happening on that same, um, that same track. And then lastly, this is just kind of my own little, like, little secret sauce thing that I've been doing for a number of years. Uh, I add a very, very tiny reverb. Um, and the idea behind this is it's not meant to be perceived as reverb. Um, it is only meant to be something that you would, it's, it's going to create the impression of like a normal voice track might feel like the voice of God, like in the middle of your head, like here. And this tiny bit of reverb makes it feel like the voice is like a little bit in front of you. And I just find that this creates kind of an interesting contrast between the host space or the studio space, which is like the voice of God. Um, and then the actualities or the interviews, which are maybe happening, um, you know, above you. So you can turn that on or off if you want. Um, and uh, it's not something that you would even really notice in speakers. It's something that you really only uh, perceive in headphones. Um, and just to point it out, this is true for third party plugins as well. Each one of these plugins has a built in uh, wet dry balance. So even if the plugins have their own wet and dry things, Reaper by default has this little knob up here, which lets you control how much unprocessed signal versus processed signal is happening. And so you can see, if you click this, I have it at 3%. So I'm only using 3% of this effect. <laughs> like it's very, very subtle. Um, but that's what it's there. That's why it's doing. The other thing that this effect can do um, is that it, for edits that are a little bit tricky, for things that just, that are futzy, that like things that we are trying to make two things edit together and they, they don't quite work. Um, just a tiny little bit, re little bit of reverb like this can um, like hide things and smooth them out a tiny bit. So that's just another reason for having it there. Um, anyway, it's there if you want it. OK, um, let's talk about the music bus. So I've got some plugins on the music bus as well. It's just an EQ and a limiter. And the reason I had the limiter there is if you had to export your music tracks separately, like as a separate stem, um, I want to have just for protection, I want to make sure that it's not going above uh, zero decibels. So it's just, it's just to prevent you from clipping, basically. But there's some cool stuff happening on this EQ plugin. Let me show you this. This is happening a little bit behind the scenes. But I've configured this EQ plugin in a way where whenever someone is speaking in the studio track or the actuality track, this node of EQ in the mid range um, is modulated. It's turning, it's turning down a little bit. So just watch this. Here's just a little bit of test audio to make sure that your audio device drivers are configured properly in Reaper and that you're hearing this successfully without any glitches or pops. Um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear audio. So as soon as I'm not talking, it goes back to where it was. And the theory behind this is uh, our ears are very sensitive to those middle frequencies where the, that's where most of our voice exists. Um, and so when someone's speaking, I'm just trying to take those frequencies away from the music for a little bit um, so they don't fight each other. And this, this is happening in addition to whatever you know, volume changes I'm making to make space for the voice. So you have the, the volume going down as well, but it's also notching out some of that EQ. Um, and the, the hope and theory behind it is that it's set in a way where you don't hear it working. <laughs> you know, like uh, as soon as someone's speaking, it goes away. And uh, you shouldn't notice it happening when someone's speaking because your attention is all on the voice anyway. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm using this EQ plugin for. Um, and Alexander, I can talk about that side chaining in a minute. Uh, the other thing that I've got set up here for people to start playing with sound design a little bit. Um, so if you type the Q key, that will reveal all of the sort of pre, all of the, all the, the um, volume or pan or effect automation that has been configured already for the project. So Q hides it and it reveals it. And as you can see, I've got some automatic, not automatic, but I have some pre-available high and low pass filtering on the music bus. So what this means is 
uh, these points at the very end of the EQ can be automated. So um, this was something that I did a lot in Love and Radio and like Radiolab did this a lot, um, would be to play with the low pass filter, meaning that um, it's letting the low frequencies pass, but it's screening out the highs progressively over time. So that sounds a little bit like, I'm just gonna solo the music track. It's kind of that techno-like effect. Let me just do that a little bit longer so you can hear how um, the high frequencies are screening out over time. So it's kind of like a volume fade, but it's volume selectively for uh, just those frequencies. Um, so that's all ready to go if you want to start playing with it. Um, one thing that I sometimes would do would be in a similar way that I'm trying to not have the voice frequencies fight with the music, I might scoop some of those high frequencies out um, when someone's talking. So I might have that more kind of underwatery filtered sound um, while someone's talking. Hearing this successfully without... So the, the music kind of like pushes back a layer uh, in your head and then comes back when I'm not talking. So that's one way of doing it. Um, and then I also have the same thing for high pass filtering, which is like the opposite of that. So um, just to give you a sense of what that sounds like, this is letting the high frequencies pass, but screening out the low. You know, and you could do them both at the same time if you want and create a band pass effect, you know. So this is just set there uh, as a way if you want to start playing with some of the stuff, if you've never played with effect automation. Um, I think for people who are just getting into sound design, this is like a really fun thing because it's really simple. Um, it, uh, it's just about playing with EQ. It's not doing anything fancy, but it has this really dramatic effect. There's also a reverb. So if, I, if you want to start playing with um, reverb on your music tales at all, um, hitting that Q key that shows all the automation possibilities. Each music track has a, a send set up to the, the reverb. So if you wanted to add like a little bit of, some people like throw to the reverb at the end. That's what this red track is here. Is, um, that will send a signal from the music one track to the reverb track here. Um, and the reverb is just a, it's one of, um, uh, it's it's a convolution reverb, um, and it's just like a, a kind of a hall reverb setting, um, and it's configured just to be kind of spacey. <laughs> so you can play with that if you want. It's there if you want it, and if you don't want it, it you just leave it off. And the same principle that I'm doing here applies to any plugin. So if I have plugins and I want to start experimenting with like what these plugins can do, by the way, if you want to see all the plugins that are just um, that are just stock that come with uh, with Reaper, um, Cocos or Co Cocos or however you pronounce it. Um, uh, that's the company that makes Reaper, and so these are all the plugins that are sort of native to Reaper. Um, and if I wanted to, let's just say, like if I wanted to automate, uh, I don't know, pitch over time. What I can do is pull up this pitch plugin, and I know it's not the, Reaper's plugins are not the prettiest, unfortunately. But if I click any one of these parameters and just touch it, move it, and then go parameter show in track envelope, now I've got the line there ready to go, and I can start, um, you know, automating it. So watch what happens to this fader when I. So. Um, it's super powerful. Um, a lot of my sound design is based on that automating of things. Like, again, this is the Wolverine session. And if I show you the automation for everything that, that's happening in this project, it, it, is, it just kind of goes on and on for layers. But um, that's how I move characters around. That's how I transition between different spaces. It's all done through this automation, a combination of automation and then these folder tracks. Um, but it's very powerful stuff. Alrighty, so I think uh, the next thing to address after this is uh, bouncing. So you've, let's say we've made this uh, whole session and now it's time to get our audio out into the world. Let's do that. So um, what I do is I just like 
lasso the whole project or the items that I want to export. And then I hit that C button to create time selections. Um, you know, you can also do it by creating a time selection here and kind of futzing with it. But uh, I just think it's faster to lasso it and then hit C. Uh, and that way you've got a very clear start and end point. Um, and then we can either click this button up here, this render button or bounce button. That's the one that looks like a waveform with a hard drive. Or uh, I have it set up to do the Pro Tools um, bounce, which is Option Command B. It opens up the same thing. And then by default, Reaper, it's Option Command R. Anyway, it also exists under the file, uh, file and render. So um, that is how you open that up. And then just to walk you through this, source is like what part of it it's bouncing. So most of us want to bounce the stuff that's happening through the master mix. So that's what it's set up to by default. If you were having to export individual files for music and sound effects and, um, uh, and, and voice, like if you're, we call this doing stems, um, there is a way of if you sort of command selectively click each one of the tracks that you want to export. So I'm highlighting all the tracks that I want to export separately. Instead of doing master mix, I could do export stems, the selected tracks, and then it will export each one of these as its own file, which is really helpful. But that's not what most of us are going to do. Most of us are going to go to the master mix. And, uh, and then I have it set to exporting the time selection. You know, um, sometimes it'll be set to entire project, but that could be problematic if, um, let's say, I think a lot of people work in the way where they've got their main project, but then they've got a bunch of outtakes and extra stuff on the side. Um, if you were to bounce the whole project, it would bounce that stuff too. So that's why I have it set to um, time selection. And that's why I do that lasso and C thing. And you can see when I do that, it tells me where in the project it's starting from, where it's ending from, and how long, um, how long it's going to be. And then if I happen to have any reverb, um, like things that are going to like last a little bit longer, I can even add a tail. So I can say like, go a little ex go a second longer or go four seconds longer or whatever. Um, and then it will add that to the, the file. So from there, I'm just going to say where I want to export it to. I'm going to export it to my desktop. And the name, I'm just going to call this demo mix. And then, you know, you can change what type of, uh, you know, settings you want for your file. Um, you can have it export as a wave or an MP3 or, you know, it also, there's a way to get FLAC and OGG support. So you can do some of these other formats, but I think most folks will either be exporting as a wave or an MP3. And you can see there's a secondary option too. So I can have one export as a wave, two export as an MP3. Um, so you can do it both at once and change the bit rate and stuff here. I'm going to do 192. Um, and you can tell it to bounce at one speed or off online, so you can listen to it while it's bouncing if that's what you want to do. But I think most of us want to bounce it as fast as possible. <laughs> so uh, full speed offline is what it's set to. And then uh, just hit render. So it renders the file. And then if I go to my desktop, you can see that I've got my demo mix wave and MP3 right there, ready to go. So that's rendering. So I know, Alexander, you have a few questions. So I just want to hold on that. I haven't forgotten about you. Um, but before I get to those, can I just open it up for general questions? Any, any, any questions at this point about anything that you've seen? With the, with the ripple? Um... Is there a, a, the way you've shown us is pretty fast already, but is there a faster way when you're hovering and you hit B, say, say you want to take out an um, or these long pauses like I'm doing now, yeah. is, is there a faster way to do it than, you know, B, B, highlight, delete, ripple, or is that sort of the, the workflow you need to do? Well, I'm trying to think of how else you, I mean, I think there's some people that think about editing as like in and out points. I think I'm one of those people where I, I if I'm editing something, I usually um, will make the cuts and then, you know, delete the thing. 
Um, so what I tend to do because I don't want to create, if you remember with Ripple, I told you if, if I were to delete like this, it would create an edit on the music track. This isn't answering your question yet, but um, if I'm in Ripple all mode and I delete something, it's going to create that edit. What I'll instead do is um, stay in Ripple off mode, like I said, do the deletion and then hold command and then nudge things together that way. So that's, I think, one of the fastest ways of doing it. Um, you can also, if you want, instead of doing the sort of BB thing, you can you know, highlight a time selection, delete that, and then cinch it together. Um, so that might be a little bit faster depending on your workflow. Um, I don't know, I'd be curious if you can think of a faster way of doing it than that, but yeah. Uh, any other questions before I pivot to Alexander's questions? Okay, so my memory is, your first question was about um, items on a specific piece of, or effects on a specific item, right? Um, there are a few ways of doing this. One way is um, when you double click on an item and you get your properties window there, you can hit take effects. And then that opens up this take effects window. And then it's just like adding a plugin for anything else. So. Um, add an EQ. Um, another way of doing it is shift E. <laughs> shift E for effect. Shift E will bring up um, the same box as if you double click and do take effects. So that's how you'd add it. And then um, the really powerful thing is once you've added that plugin, um, shift E again, if I, let's say I made this a low pass filter um, and I want to automate the frequency of the low pass filter to make that swooping, you know, low pass filter sweep. The last thing I touched, just go to parameter, uh, show in take envelope, show, yeah, that's right. And then it'll add that as a um, layer on top of the item. So I can just start to, uh, oops. I can start to edit it the same way as if it were automation. And so I can do all of that sound design on the item itself. Um, so just, I'm gonna do a bunch of crazy stuff here and then I can hold option and, oop, not that's option and drag and bend it. So just listen to that. Is or pops. And you can see it's automating it. So that's how you do it. Um, and one interesting thing to know is that, uh, let's say I made some cuts to this and I did shift E on this middle item. So now I'm making independent, like each one of these has its own effect on it at this point, since I made cuts to it. So it'll still sound the way you expect it to sound. But if I do shift E and delete a plugin on that middle, so now this one has a plugin, this one doesn't. And then it will come back to having a plug in that way. So that's just something to be aware of um, if you are, if you're editing something that already hasn't. What I tell people to do is if you're doing this thing, put the plug in on it before you start doing editing. Um, and, uh, and that way it'll sound the way you expect it to sound. Um, but it, it's also a way of like, if you needed to apply something specifically to just one moment, you can cut it up and then add its own effect and do it that way. Um, but I just think it's so cool that you can do that on individual items and also automate them and that it's non-destructive. Like doing things the audio suite way just like uh, is unnecessary <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and then I think your next question, Alexander, was about the side chaining. Um, and that's a little more advanced, but let me show it to you. Uh, so if you remember each track, um, has um, by default two channels per track. And then if I click this panel up here, uh, I can set it up to have four channels or you know up to 64 channels. Um, what I do is I make the music bus be a four channel track. And then I have it receive signal from the studio bus and the actuality bus. So that's what these are doing right here. I've created receives from both of those spaces, both of those tracks. 
And then instead of doing the normal send and receive thing where uh, it would be channels one and two of the send tracks going into channels one and two of the receive tracks, what I'm instead doing is saying channels one and two of the of the studio and actuality tracks are going into channels three and four of the music track. So we're not hearing those channels three and four. Those three and four channels aren't routed anywhere. Um, but what that means is when we go to um, the EQ plugin and we find that thing that we want to modulate, in this case, it's we're, to do this effect, we're modulating the gain of that middle EQ band. So I click gain right here and then parameter and you can see i had this checked already but if, if you were just setting it up you would go to parameter modulation so that's saying this is a parameter that i want to do something to modulate click that um and the way i've already set it up is i say i want to modulate it based on the audio signal or a side chain so i could have it taking from its own you know, if I if I set it to tracks one and two, it would be reading, it would be modulating based on the signal of the music channel itself. But since I've set up that routing, I can say take it from channels three and four, and now it's only responding to the level of those other tracks. Um, and I can do a bunch of things to customize it here. I can um, change the attack and the release, and uh, and actually, if the if the effect is too strong, I can watch this. I gotta turn on the dialogue track without any so if it's glitches too or much, pops. If I'm noticing it, um, and that it sounds like smooth, clear I can make audio, it more subtle, or I can make it more dramatic. See, without any glitches so that's too, or pops, like I hear that happen, um, I hear the music and that it sounds like so smooth, clear much. audio. Um, so that's how I do that. Um, and that general kind of thing, like that's how you'd set up a side chain for other types of things too like if you wanted to sidechain a compressor you know um this this is getting really in the weeds but you'll notice that on every plugin right next to where you have um the wet dry balance there's also this in and out pin which basically you can route channels one and two into channels three and four of different things so by default you'll have these sort of diamond configurations but this is just like another way of changing where signal goes um and uh if you are familiar at all with like a routing matrix which i haven't shown this yet but if you go to view uh routing matrix you can see a routing matrix for the whole project if you want like that so you can see where different tracks are having sends and receives and where they're going to um so like one is in and one is out or you could look at it as a wiring diagram and see it more like a modular kind of thing and you know, see how things are routed. So I haven't played with this a ton, but um, all of this stuff is accessing all the same data. Uh, it's just different visualizations for the same types of connections. Just this one is a little bit more graphically forward. And um, there's some people that whose brains work better in this kind of way, and uh, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? I can also just play a little demo piece. That's kind of how I've been ending these is just by showing uh, like a little love and radio piece and showing how all this stuff kind of fits together. But before I do that, I um, just want to open it up to if you have any, any questions about anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about uh, I play it and then we can call it a day. So uh, this is the first chapter from my last Love and Radio piece, the last piece I did before I left the show. Um, and it's from an episode called Doing the No-No. Um, and it's about a rather controversial character, a bio artist named Adam Zaretsky, who um, likes incorporating living things in his art pieces. He's sort of a, he makes sculptures and stuff, but he also does performance art. And um, what makes him especially controversial is that he, wants to genetically engineer a human embryo as a work of art. So uh, that's sort of how the piece starts is sort of dropping in. You know, all of our Love and Radio pieces have these cold opens, or at least when I was working on the show, they all had cold opens. Um, so you're, you're dropped in with really no 
no awareness of what we're about to talk about. But, um, and then you can see that like, this is the edit here on the top. Um, for anyone who's interested in this kind of thing, I actually used a mid side microphone. So that's why it looks like the waveform is just on one side. Um, so it's a way of doing stereo stuff. Um, and then I have a plugin that's turning it from mid side into stereo. Uh, but below that, I've got some music sound design. Um, that's all in orange. And then the sound effects here in pink. And um, I'm not doing a ton automation wise. I've got a little like low pass filtering happening at the very end of the music tail. How about we just add a little music or add a little reverb to that for, for good measure? Because <laughs> why not? Um, and yeah, let me just play it and uh, we can watch it. I'll have maybe the EQ up or something, or I can show some of the effects. I don't know what's most helpful. If you want, if you want to change my view, let me know. Um, but uh, that's hopefully you can see most of everything. Okay, so here's the piece uh, doing the no-no. I made a sculpture of Uranus's castrated penis. Apparently, Kronos cut off his father's penis and threw it in the ocean in the Peloponnesian Sea. He cut off his father's penis because his mother gave birth to a hundred-handed titan, like a centipede human. And Uranus was so grossed out by the mutant with the hundred hands that he kept that being, that person, his child, inside a cave, inside of a castle. Even some people say he pushed it back up into his wife Gaia's vagina. At which point she told her son Kronos, why don't you go cut his dick off, right? And he did, he sliced off his father's penis and he threw it in the sea. And from the foam and blood of the leaking castrated penis of Uranus, came Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. It's a strange myth. I didn't know really much about it. I had gone for the centipede thing because I thought, well, maybe I'll make a person with a hundred hands someday. But every time someone chooses someone else to make a baby with, they're making a freak for their own pleasure. It doesn't matter if it's random recombination. It doesn't matter if it's based on love. It doesn't matter if this being is cared for, sent to like a really nice preschool, you know, or fed well, or fed a bunch of crap. What matters is reproduction itself is kind of like a freak show, right? You want people to see your display of fertility. You want people to see that you have the wealth to go ahead and procreate. You want people to see your child perform a piano recital. And you want to be able to show off that your genes were worthy of getting to the next generation. It's really kind of sad. Breeding is narcissism. It's like your little mirror, right? I was in a meeting that was talking about the ethics of genetic modification and they asked parents to raise their hand if they would be willing to pay an extra five or $10,000 to have children with guaranteed perfect pitch so that they would, you know, basically not need to pay for all those piano lessons, right? And most parents were like, yeah, that's cheaper in the long run. I mean, and that's partly what they were thinking, but they were also thinking, I'd like a kid who's a good musician. But I do know when people go to for genetic counseling, if they were offered not only to eliminate negative traits, but to add positive traits, as long as you put a price tag on it, someone's gonna hit by it now. It's the other side of the mountain effect. And it's what will drive personal genetic alteration. There are certain people that think that the human genome is sacrosanct. 
And there are other people that really think that we should just go forward as fast as possible and are actually actively engaging in projects like this. It's not illegal. There's an uncovering of everything, like a new Magellan-like map of the inner world of our genome. But the purposes that that will be put towards are not necessarily health-based. Obviously, the military wants to make super soldiers. Obviously, we have a space program to look after, and we want to be able to live on Mars. We're going to need some special humans for that. What's interesting to me is to help people understand all the ways they could go in. What are the other ways that this could go that might even be preferable? What if we became solar powered, right? Like what if humans actually could photosynthesize? What would be good about that? Well, you wouldn't need to pay rent because you'd have central heating. You wouldn't need to work because all you have to do is sit in a hammock. Um, skin cancer would probably go up. People around the equator would become obese. The Nordic races would be suddenly really skinny and have to run down to the equator during the winter, like at the dark, suicidal end of the long night. And, you know, in a neo-colonialist way, probably eat some really overweight, equatorian, solar-powered people. And weirdly, we might actually grow to be flat and have webs underneath our arms that collect more sun. That could be a problem, but it could be great. Like a giant, flat, bat-like, solar-collecting human beatnik. From Radiotopia, you're listening to Love and Radio. I'm Nick Vanderkolk. Today's episode, Doing the No-No, featuring Adam Zaretsky. So... That's how I use those things to do the kind of radio that I make. Well, uh, unless there are any last minute questions, maybe we call it a night. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <laughs> You're more than welcome. This was, uh, I, I really enjoy teaching and um, yeah, I hope, I hope that, uh, you know, my biggest hope is that people like pass on this, you know, the system and this workflow and that like, if it's helpful for folks that, um, you know, share it with your friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you have, um, like what Heidi just said in the chat, do you have a tip jar? Or oh, something? Uh, yeah, I do. I can't find it anymore. It popped up in the link to like when I opened the zoom and now I can't find it. <laughs> yeah, sure. One second. Uh, but if you could drop it in, that would be great. Sure. That's definitely not why I'm doing this, but... Um, <laughs> sure, but it's, you know, that's like most of your Saturday. It's Saturday night here. I'm in France. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I do appreciate thank you. it. Um, I just need to find the link. Hold on a second. Cool. Thank you. And thank you so much. Yeah, I've like, I have used Reefer for a long time, but kind of just taught myself random bits and pieces as I went along and never actually like started from the start. So I yeah. learned heaps. Well, that's great. I mean, it's, uh, it's super flexible, like, you know, like you already know. Um, but I just think it's crazy that like, I feel like I learned, like I said, like I learned something, here's something I, I never knew until recently under the file menu, there's a, a batch file item converter. So if you want to take a bunch of waves and turn them into MP3s, like that's all built in. Or, or here's something I also didn't demo. I'm like, oh, I forgot about this, forgot about this. Uh, the Media Explorer, this is where I keep my entire sound library. And so like I've imported my, all of the sound effects that I own. And then I can just search mm -hmm. for like, you know, uh, you know, explosion. Do I not have an explosion? I think maybe my hard drive isn't plugged in and that's why. Anyway, like all this stuff is built in. It's so cool. I want people to know about yeah, it. Yeah, it's cool. Alrighty. Well, thank you all for your attention and I uh, hope you have a great Saturday and go out and make some kick-ass radio. All right. Thank you so much. Bye everybody.